so I'm just going to shoot this over to the uh, pre-show song, so we'll be on mute until we start. All right, guys, real quick, I'm going to play our anthem. Mm. So it's 7 o'clock, so I'm going to start the intro song. So that's playing now. Evening, whatever. Good evening, everybody. You are watching America First. My name is Nicholas J. Fuentes, and we have an exciting episode for you tonight. As advertised, we have a debate with Destiny. Destiny, better known as Stephen Bonnell, the second professional video game player. A little bit of a bug man thing, but you know what? We'll let it slide. He's here with us tonight. He's going to be a good sport. Stephen, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, and I think the people can hear you. I'm going to check in the live chat just real quick to make sure they can hear you. If you guys could tell us real quick in the live chat, if you can hear Destiny, we'll get started right away. And so there's a little bit of a delay, so we'll see. If they start saying you're a little bit quiet, so I'm going to turn down my mic, and then I'll turn up the sound. And then we should be in good shape, okay? Abitha. Let me just boost that, and then... Okay, why don't you say something else, Destiny? Testing, one, two, one, two. Okay, looks like that uh, should be, that should do it. All right, so the first thing I want to get started on, because I watched a few of your debates before. Um, I'm going to be honest, I wasn't too sure who you were, and that makes sense. Yeah, I'm no not into the video game, the Twitch thing, so. But somebody recommended, I think somebody CC'd us in a tweet and said, we should do a debate, and I understand after I've watched some of your some of your episodes with Sargon, with some other video game players, Jontron, I remember that was a big one. I understand that you are opposed to me on the issue of immigration. And so I wanted to start in pretty, I think, a, a pretty good middle ground to begin with, which is, and I'll ask you something, you'll have to just indulge me for a moment, you'll have to trust I'm going somewhere with this, but what is your opinion of democracy? And I promise we'll get to the, immig the immigration issue through this, but what do you believe about democracy? Oh, that's, a, that's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, <laughs> loaded question. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I'd probably take the quote, um, democracy is, I think it's like democracy is the worst form of government except for everything else. So, mm. so like it's like I guess it works. There are a lot of problems inherent with democracy, um, especially in the in the way we have it set up in America uh, with our current voting system. But uh, as, as many problems as I have with it, it's probably better than anything else that I can think of. Um, people point to a lot of different types of governments, but everything has like a lot of inherent flaws to it. I don't know if there can ever be a perfect form of government. So uh, is that is that an yeah. okay enough answer? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's good. No, that's that's good. And I apologize if I caught you off guard with that a little bit. But I always start with this because the immigration issue, it can be contentious when it gets to race and culture. That's really, I think, the central question of immigration mm -hmm. um, and, and what demographics fundamentally comes down to is that question. But and that can be like a third rail thing. I remember you said uh, often on Sargon of Akkad that neither side would change the other side's mind. But this 
this topic, I think, coming at it from this perspective, I think both sides can kind of come together. And I apologize if people are expecting fire. We'll get there. But to start off, I thought I would extend the olive branch, and I, w- I would bring up this, and I want your thoughts on this. Uh-huh. So in, um, in 1965, as many immigration hawks understand, the hart seller Act was passed through the Congress. And the most important provision of the hart seller Act, well, two of the most important provisions, were number one, it eliminated the national origins quota. So whereas before, it was largely constrained how much immigration came into the United States from Asia, from Latin America, from Africa. It was mostly European. So that was number one. And number two, there was no numerical restrictions on immediate relatives of immigrants after this act passed. And so the people that sold this immigration bill, the Hart Seller Act in 65, Ted Kennedy said, and he was one of the main proponents of it in the Senate, he said, quote, our cities will not be flooded with a million immigrants annually. annually. Secondly, the ethnic mix of this country will not be upset. President Johnson said this is not a revolutionary bill. It does not affect the lives of millions. Now, both of those statements turned out to be lies, because since the 65 Immigration Act, we saw that the composition of immigration fundamentally changed. It went from 68 percent European and Canadian in 1950 or uh, yeah, Canadian to 48 percent from Latin America, 35 percent from Asia in the period from 1971 to 1991. And then in addition to that, the number of immigrants increased as well, whereas in the 60s, 11 percent of population growth is immigrants. In the 1970s, it was 33 percent immigrants. And in the 1980s, uh, 39 percent. And so having said all of that, this is something that a lot of uh, anti or rather pro-immigration people aren't familiar with. Do you think that it was right? Do you think it was just that the composition of this country and the composition of immigration was changed fundamentally without a vote, without the will of the electorate being expressed. And I'll let you, you can take a little time on this. Um, so I'm not familiar with the with the specific act. Was it, This was something that was passed through Congress, right? Yes. It wasn't just a presidential, okay. I mean, if Congress voted on it, I mean, those are the elected, that's how our government is set up, right? It was a democratic republic, we elect elected officials that represent us and vote for bills in Congress. So I don't know if I necessarily buy the the electorate's views weren't represented if it was voted on via Congress. If this was by executive act, I would agree. But um, I, I mean, for me personally, I really don't care much about like ethnic background or country of origin. Like these aren't really questions that I like wrestle with. It doesn't bother me if certain people from certain areas come here, I guess. It's not something that I'm majorly concerned with. Um, also like another random thing in 1965, um, when this was, when they initially like presented this and, and said that the demographic, like, uh, composition of the country wouldn't change much. I don't, they might've been lying at the time. It might've been that the birth rates were a lot higher back then too. I think when you're, when you're at the, um, 50s, 60s, I think the birth rate was like, um, like three or more. And now we've fallen to like, what, like 1.6, 1.7. So that might've been maybe some factor in there as well. Right. They didn't assume that people would stop having so many children in the United States, but. Well, but consider it was also it was not only that the makeup of immigration shifted, but the percentage of population growth that was accounted for by immigration also tripled and in the Uh span of 10 years. So it wasn't like this was over the course of 50 years in a matter of five years. The composition and the number of immigrants increased. And that's, of course, proportional to population growth as a whole. And so it's interesting because I and I only ask that because. For so many leftists, for so many Democrats, for so many, and I don't know if you describe yourself as that, but generally left-leaning people, they hold up democracy as very sacred. And it's interesting to me that because it was passed by Congress, and we know that Congress really isn't necessarily representative or totally um, accountable to the people, that you would sort of give them a pass, even though they lied about the effects of it directly, both the president and the main proponents of it, and and you don't you don't seem to be bothered by this, or you think that that it's sufficient that they were representatives. So we're trying to assign whether or not we're trying to assign like a like a morality to them passing the act for whether or not they lied or told the truth. I I don't know at the time what data they had available to them. I don't know if they sincerely believed what they were saying or if they actually had like a like this uh, subversive attitude where they knew that it was going to lead to what it. I I don't know that I can't make that. I, I don't if if there were like leaked papers or something that showed that like oh well actually we know that you know this is all bullshit and the demographic composition of the country is going to change so much and we're going to pass this act and we're going to tell everybody a lie about it. like i don't know if that's true or not I, I can't i can't i mean if they did actually lie about it then yeah sure that's pretty bad your elected official should never be lying to you. i think that's always an abhorrent thing but i i don't know i mean if they did then sure but i don't know if they actually did or not 
Sure. And, and that's fair. And that's a fair contingency to bring up that, you know, we don't really know if they lied. But I think what I'm really asking is not so much whether they had and forgive me for not phrasing it originally this way, but mm -hmm. maybe not so much that they lied, maybe not so much that it was intentional. I certainly have speculated that they have just because of the incentives that are available. For example, um, you know, Hispanics and Asians tend to vote for the party of bigger government, which is the Democrats. And so certainly there is a motive. But putting aside all speculation, because, you know, it could go both ways, whether they were lying or whether they had good intentions. But given that the public unknowingly voted for a reform that would unnaturally, unorganically change the composition of immigration. Do you, I guess the fundamental question is, do you think that even though this act was against the public will, because in 1965, I mean, you consider what white America was like in 1965, given the civil rights issues and everything else. White America in 1965 was not open to ethnically transforming the country into a majority minority country. So I guess I guess what I'm asking is, even though you think it's perhaps a positive good that people are coming over here, do you think that it was just, do you think that it was moral for this legislation to go through, for this reform to go through, whether intentional or not, to fundamentally alter the demographics of the country, even though it was diametrically against the will of the people. I mean, I I would always answer no to that because in a democratic republic, your senators and the and their congressmen in the house should be voting with, for in favor of their constituents. If this was such a big deal, then why weren't all these people voted out? And then in the next election cycle, the bill overturned. Well, of course, because it was a slow process. The demographic transformation has happened relatively click quickly, I think, relative to the lifespan of a nation, but relative to the lifespan of a person. And you look at other things that were going on as well, whether that was the Cold War, the stagflation of the 1970s. Not only was it slow going, if you're watching it day by day, and we sort of woke up in the 1990s, 2000s, 2010s, and realized what had transformed. But additionally, you had other things going on. And so I would say that... Um, I think that's a, a good place to start, that you acknowledge that it was wrong for this legislation to go through well, because guess, it was against the will of the people. So, like, on that real quick, like, I guess when you say, like, the transformation was slow, like, I have a very low opinion of most people in government. I have a really hard time believing that people in the 60s foresaw that, like, if they enacted this leg this legislation now, like, in 30 and 40 years, the demographics would massively change. Like, I don't know if they actually all believed that at the time, that it would change as radically as it has. That's, that seems like a pretty a pretty big jump, like a pretty big leap of faith to believe that. Like people in government seem like they barely understand what they're doing right now. The idea that they were all like these, you know, political masterminds that could see 30, 40 years into the future seems a little unlikely to me. Well, uh, that is a bit of a dodge um, because certainly there there have been politicians who have proposed things like this before. As you know, the Kalergi plan was uh, a plan that was formulated by a Jewish person who was instrumental in the United Nations. And, and he postulated, I think it was immediately before or during World War II, that the grand scheme that what he wanted to see – was massive immigration into Germany from North Africa to, in his own words, breed out the war strains of the German people. So certainly, certainly, I don't think it's beyond a politician's um, or people that control politicians' ambitions to do this sort of long-scale thing or long-term thing. Um, but again, I, I want to get away from this assigning intent, assigning sure. malicious well, when intent. You, when, you, say, when you ask me if something yeah. was like evil or not, we're talking intent right because if a whole bunch mm -hmm. of people passed the act and they didn't foresee that those are going to be the long-term ramifications then i can't really say that they acted in an evil or malicious way by intentionally not representing the will of their people right so we're it's kind of a question of intent at that point not necessarily not necessarily i don't believe that intent is is um crucial in determining whether something is moral or immoral as we know the the road to hell is paved with good intentions and and i would say additionally with politicians they saw people that work in government offices, people that take the U.S. census, for example, people that are charged with overseeing these sort of affairs. They understood very quickly what was happening. As we saw in the 1970s, these trends became very apparent. And and it was not a slow process that European Americans became displaced, it, or rather it was a slow process that this, the displacement happened, but it was actually a very rapid process that the composition of immigration changed. So by 1970, five years after the act, 
We saw throughout the 1970s that the composition changed very rapidly and the amount of immigrants changed very rapidly. The displacement didn't, but the composition did. So whether or not they knew in 1965, they knew by 1970. And so I would say that do you think that fundamentally it was wrong? It was a bad thing that, you know, whether or not you're for immigration, whether or not politicians understood the implications that this drastic reform happened against the will of the people. Um, I mean, so th- th- this is kind of like a, I-, I have to take this in chunks. So f- we have a slight philosophical disagreement in here. For me, I think that intention is really important. Um, let's say that a congressman passes a $5 billion reform to redo like the pipes in some city and they do it. And it turns out that by redoing it, they end up poisoning the townspeople. I wouldn't assign like an evil intent to that person or, or, or say that he acted wrongly or evilly if he was working with the best information available at the time. But I would say that the effect could be bad. So I think we're, there's like two different questions here on whether the whether the initial passing of the legislation was an immoral thing versus whether the effects themselves were immoral or bad. So in, in so far as the official the um, initial passing of the legislation, I can't speak to that because I don't I don't know the intentions of the people at the time or if there was a massive subversive movement or something. I, I have to assume that they voted what they believed would happen. But I, I, I do concede it's possible that a lot of senators and congressmen got together to do something very subversive maybe um but in terms of whether or not the effect itself was bad um well this comes to current day how we feel i guess the country should operate and for me personally immigration is not um people coming from different uh, countries or ethnic origin or whatever is not something that i care about so from my point of view i wouldn't say that it's a bad thing okay but i think I think there's a flaw in your analogy. If we could stick with that for uh-huh. a moment, you said sure. this is comparable to a, like a local politician who replaces a pipe and it turns out that there's poison then in the water supply. I think in this particular example, you're referring to more specifically a maintenance issue, but above all else, you're referring to something that is routine, something that is not really a reform. The Immigration Act was a reform that is arguable whether it was good or bad. Poisoning water is, is a failure of government, but a reform is taking government and the society in a different direction. So I don't think that necessarily holds. I think, and I think I'm, I really want to hold you to this because I think, I think it's very instrumental to this issue, not, not only the reform itself, but how the reform has been gone about. I okay. think that's very important. Uh, before we, okay, so then if I say any, if I ever say anything that you disagree with, you can stop me immediately, okay? I won't take it as an sure. thing so okay. that we can, so let me construct then, I'll try to construct a more accurate analogy so that it holds up to your scrutiny, okay? Let's say that you have a, uh, let's say that you have a city and you have a guy that sees there's another city that lives right next to you, okay? Let's say that the mm-hmm. guy says, um, we need more workers in our city. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass legislation, an, an overhaul in how we bring in workers so that a bunch of workers from that other city can come over here. So let's say that he does it, and let's say that there is bipartisan support and there's state legislature to do it. Everybody votes for it. Everybody's happy with it. And then over the next 10 to 20 years, tons of workers come over from there. And let's say that it drives down the price of wages so much that all the natives go out of work. A lot of them leave the city, and the city ends up destroyed. Not physically destroyed, but like the quality of living and every, by every measurable metric, um, real wages, everything has fallen. So I'm going to stop you for okay. a moment. Mm-hmm. Um My problem with this analogy is that this is an unintended consequence in terms of like people, even the people, the electorate might not understand the downward pressure on wages. But I think with the immigration, it is a reform that happened. It took place immediately. And it's something that the people would have not wanted understanding exactly what it would have entailed. What you're talking about is an unintended consequence of workers coming here. But what I'm talking about is people that that would be rejected coming here in the first place but you but i mean this the the act that you're talking about had bipartisan support on congress you're saying that every single congressman knew what was really going on democrat and republican but they were trying to hide it from everybody in their votes or no well but by 1970 they did understand yeah and but by then 19- why didn't we vote in people to to get rid of the act or whatever why didn't we make because- that a big I don't the people did not know what was happening, but the people that were taking the statistics did. And so, you know, I don't don't understand that the statistics are publicly available. If this you keep saying you keep going back to the representing the will of the electorate, if their will was so strong and they hated this and these stats are being taken and they're publicly available, why wouldn't this have been like an election issue? Like it kind of is. Well, this is not. Yeah. 
Sure. Well, this is not an issue, as you know, that was brought up in media. This is an issue which has actually been that was actually kept pretty quiet until the end of the Cold War, obviously, because you had during the 1970s. I don't think it's cop out to say that during the 1970s, you had more pressing concerns. And this, I think, again, relates to the special nature of the displacement, that it was slow going relative to the lifespan of a person that either you have a change in composition of immigration, or you have the fact that you have an Iranian hostage crisis, or you have the fact that inflation is upwards of 10 percent, unemployment is upwards of of 10 percent. So I think that it's fair to say that the people were were kept in the dark on this issue, even though the government basically understood what was going on. And and again, I want to get away from intent. I want I really just want to get your take on something that's pretty abstract, which is is it wrong that a reform happened that was against the will of the people? And, and we'll, I want to like condense well, out all of the, the problem all is, of, when you say against the will of the people, we're talking yeah. intent here. Like, I, I don't see how I can address this without looking at the intent. Cause if all the legislatures didn't foresee this happening, which it sounds like they didn't, because even by your admission, it wasn't until the seventies that they got the stats in and saw how things were rolling out. Then I, I can't really say that it was immoral that they did it against the will of the people. If the will of the people, seems to be represented in Congress. Again, it had bipartisan support. It's, I don't think they foresaw it turning out the way that it did. I, I don't know how I can answer the question without addressing the sure. intent part of it. Yeah, well, I think here's here's how I think we could get away from the intent. I think perhaps immorality was the wrong way to go about it. I think perhaps justice is a better way to go about it because I believe morality— justice without morality, though? Well, here, here's why. Because morality, I think, is something that's more particular to to choice, individual choice. You know, Hayek said that the particulars of a spontaneous order can be neither just or, or unjust or immoral or moral. I think it would be more accurate, which is to say that an institution, I don't think, can have moral responsibility. But if you're looking at it more more plainly, I think, from an independent perspective of a society, do you think it is it is a just thing that people living under a government are subject to reforms that they would not be for, that, that is against their will? And so we can take out moral responsibility of legislators and just say broadly, without assigning blame or responsibility to government actors, is it an injustice when something, when a government makes a reform that is against the will of the people, whether or not it's intended, whether or not it's moral or not. Is it just for that to happen? Um, I mean, I'm, so I'm sorry to get like really hung up on this, but like, so this question would go to the specific form of government that you've, that, that you live under. So for instance, if you were to ask me, is it okay for under a dictatorship for the dictator to do something that doesn't represent the will of the people? Well, that particular form of government would almost necessitate those types of things happening. If you were to ask me in a direct democracy where every single person votes on every single measure, if it was okay for government to do something that doesn't represent the will of the people, then, you know, I would say, well, no, of course not. That's the type of the, or of course that is immoral. I'm sorry. That would be unjust because a direct democracy, everybody votes on every single thing. We live in a democratic republic, which means mm -hmm. that we don't do a direct vote on every single thing. So, I guess I don't under if you ask me like is it just that a bill might pass that people don't wouldn't wouldn't themselves vote for I mean in a democratic republic we elect people that we believe will vote in our interests I don't know if I would say that it's unjust or immoral if they vote a different way because in our system you can vote them out in, in two or four or six years or whatever anyway so I, I guess I'm, sure. I'm having a hard time seeing like the unjust part. Like we live in a democratic republic. We vote for people that we trust to vote in favor of us. Sometimes they don't always vote exactly as you'd want them to, but that's part of our process. I don't think I would call it unjust when it doesn't, when every single senator or a congressman doesn't vote exactly as you want them to. I have a hard time calling that unjust. Okay. Well, I, I have a couple of things to, mm -hmm. excuse me, a little burp there to address there. Number one, I think it's very important are, and this is something that many people get wrong, by the way, or maybe not wrong, but but don't understand so well, which is to say that our system of government, our system of government, the instrument of our government is representative democracy, which is to say, and you are correct, mm -hmm. that we elect representatives, and formerly the state legislators chose senators. That's not the case anymore, but that's how the government was set up. That was the instrument of our government was a, a democratic process, and that's how we made decisions. However, I think it's more important to note the definition of sovereignty in the United States of America as it was intended at the founding, and I think we can all agree until the present day, which is to say that in a democracy, the sovereign of a nation, which is 
the person that makes choices, that has jurisdiction, that has the moral jurisdiction over the nation. In a democracy, the moral jurisdiction is a majority. If you have 50 percent plus one, you are free to act. It is righteous for you to act. That is the expression of the will of the people. In well, our country, it's it's different, Wait, right? In our yeah, country, sorry. yeah, because I'm using it to contrast. Maybe that's not perfect, but I, I do know about our system. We're in a republic. In a republic, what that means is that the people are sovereign. And this is really important stuff, that when the founders set up our government and when they wrote the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they set it up understanding that our rights come from God. And we, and whether or not you believe in God, that is the founding mandate for the government, was that our rights come from God, people create a constitution, and the constitution creates a government. But fundamentally, the sovereign of the nation is every individual person. So if the acts of government go against the sovereign will of the people, which were the majority at the time, and probably the vast majority, who had opposed a demographic shift like this. And our representatives passed legislation, whether intentionally or not, that is a failure of government. That is an injustice by government. And and again, I'm not I'm not impugning individual senators or congressmen who passed that because it did pass by a majority and with votes from both parties, but it is a failure of government. It is an injustice by government, impersonally, that this happened. Can you agree with this? I feel like we're. I, this is like a really weird, like consequentialist question. I, I don't, I don't think. I think we're at an impasse here. Um, okay. Part, we can find so, this at the so like, um, t no, I, I can't do like a perfect analogy, I guess. But like, if government passes something and they believe that it will function a certain way, and it ends up functioning a different way, I don't know if I could call the initial passing of that legislation unjust. Do you at least understand my point of view, even yeah. if you don't agree? Yeah. How, how about how about the war in Iraq? Do you think the war in Iraq was uh, just? Um. I would argue, no, the war in Iraq wasn't just, but mm. I, I don't think the people that were voting for war were trying to, like, subvert the will of the people or do something. And it seemed like most of the United States was on board to do it at the time, so we probably mm. should have as a country, I think. Um, well, although that gets a little weird because you can get into how um, Bush and Cheney kind of misled people with the intel on the WMD and whatnot. So I, that gets a little bit more... Grainy, ah, but... okay. Well, but you see then where... Where the contradiction lies, because well, but, but the, before Iraq, we do this, the difference is that like I can point to evidence where I know that the Bush administration created another organization with the intention of misleading the American public on W days. I don't know if this happened in the specific act that you're talking about. Mm. If it did, then then I agree. One hundred. If it did, then at that point I can easily say it's an injustice. If they knew all the stats on what immigration was going to be and they lied about it, or if they created a separate organization to create fake stats to convince the American public, then I would one hundred percent agree that that would be an injustice and it would be a horrible thing similar to the Iraq war but I but I don't think there's any evidence of that happening so I can't really say that it was an injustice at the time it seems like the will of the people was represented in a bipartisan way but it seems like the act just turned out in a way that we didn't want it to which so I have a hard time calling that an injustice at that particular point in time maybe it's an injustice the government didn't address it later or maybe the legislation could have be could have been written with caps in place or something if if something did happen I guess but I mean it had bipartisan support the elected people uh, voted on it it wasn't a big election issue after after that, so it seems like the will of the people, in terms of how our government functions, was represented. So it's well, okay, but so you really your only difference there is that you believe that the Bush Cheney government intentionally misled, and the people who wrote Heart Seller did not intentionally mislead. That's Correct. that's the difference. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right, and and people can look into this. People can look into this. I encourage them to. I, I think a case can be made that there was intent on the part of the the co-signers of the heart seller act but we'll move on from well, that wait, i know well, that wait i'm curious just because you said that w yeah. what is your evidence for the intent there was there ever well, like I mean, any can... sure i mean you can look at the you can look at the actual provisions of the act which was to eliminate quotas for national origin so it it would almost be impossible for them not to know you, you understand because but, but then why didn't the you know, 80 percent that, that function in no other way why didn't like the 70 to 80 percent of democrats and republicans that voted on it and saw the provisions why couldn't they deduce that from the listed provisions did nobody read the legislation or i'm i'm sure they did and that, that's sort of the point though is because if you were to eliminate the the quota for national origins it would it would necessarily have to change the composition of immigration. And if you eliminate the numerical quota for immediate relatives of immigrants, it would necessarily increase the amount of immigration. So 
I guess I, I, just, I think I don't, that I don't it's, understand. it's almost impossible. Yeah, I don't ahead. understand why nobody that voted on it then, because this seems like a big hindsight. Like we're playing a hindsight bias right now. Like, well, obviously mm -hmm. this is how it would turn out. It doesn't seem like it was that mm -hmm. obvious at the time if nobody made a deal about it, though. Well, I, I think that kind of speaks to the fact that that they did know. But, you know, that's a disagreement of sure. opinion, which also, neither of us have. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and then real fast, I don't like to draw an equivalency between that and, and the war in Iraq. I think that the war in Iraq was very blatantly missold to the American public. The CIA mm -hmm. was very confident that that uh, Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction. The Bush Where's your evidence for that? Well, the Bush administration made their own separate organization to take direct unvetted intel from CIA sources that were not given Which to them. Which organization? Um, I have to go and look up the exact department that they made. Um, well, because and, and the only reason why I ask is because MI6 intelligence, Israeli intelligence and KGB intelligence that were offered to the United States all confidently asserted that there were WMDs. Elements in Saddam Hussein's own government asserted the same so thing. I can't, I can't speak for MI6, but I know that the CIA at the time was pretty clear that they did not believe that there were WMDs in Iraq. But it was when Bush and Cheney set up a separate branch to take unvetted intel and then funnel that directly into the White House that they were able to get what they wanted and then sell that to the American public. The idea that Iraq contained WMDs was not information that came from the CIA. That came from Bush and Cheney's own specially created um, little side thing. I'll, I'll find the exact name if you give me like two seconds. I can find it. Sure, yeah. Um, the only it, was reason called, it was called the Office of Special Plans. Here you go. You can okay. read this here. So they took unvet. So the way that the chain usually works is people who are very high up making administrative decisions or decisions related to war are usually briefed by people in the IC and in the intelligence community. They will take a plethora of information using their abilities as intelligence officers. They'll combine it into ways that they think make sense. You know, they they know what's probably true, what's probably not true, and then they give presentations to people in higher offices about what they would recommend or what they think is true or not true. Since the CIA wasn't giving Bush the answer that he wanted in regards to WMDs in Iraq. They created a separate office of special plans that drafted raw intelligence into their office so that they could take whatever pieces they wanted and then sell to the American public the idea of WMDs. I'm not really concerned like whether or not you, because I know there's a lot to just dump on you. I don't expect you to believe right, it or right, not right. believe it. Yeah. I'm just, I, just, I don't like to point to this and say that like the Iraq war was the same as the heart seller thing. I don't think that that's right. a fair comparison. This was much more uh, subversive in my opinion, but... Yeah, no, I, I I tend to agree with you that it was a subversive. I think the war in Afghanistan was was the same thing. So I, by the way, I don't want anyone to get the impression that I'm trying to justify the Iraq war, but simply to say that I think that there is, you know, maybe it's not a, a perfect analogy. And I think you would agree that there are things that make it totally insufficient altogether to compare. But I think, you know, we've we've stated our case. I think it comes down to the question of intent and we can leave it to the audience to figure out if similar intent or evidence exists for intent on the side of 65. So mm -hmm. I just I want to go over that because people so rarely talk about that, that part of the argument, which is to say that people talk about the consequences, but not so much the, the genesis of them. So I'm glad we sure. covered that. I think that was that was interesting. But so then we have to get to the consequences, which is immigration from the third world, i.e. non-white immigration, not from Europe, has it been good or bad for the country? Now, I'm curious about your position because I'm not totally sure. Are you saying that it is a positive good that non-white immigrants are coming to the country, or are you saying that you're that it doesn't matter the composition of the immigrants. Yeah, so I, I'm neutral to the composition of people coming into the country in terms of how they look and what their cultural background is or whatever. Um, specific metrics like value to the economy mm -hmm. would be things that I'm very concerned about. Um, and I guess things like crime rates and whatnot would be things that I'd mm -hmm. be concerned about as well. If they're overrepresented in those demographics, then these would be things that I was concerned about or would be concerned about sharing. OK, sure, because, you know, I look at one of the biggest things I go by is, is not so much economics. I'm not really people are very tempted to make the economic argument. And, and I had Will Nardi on and he was very quick and keen to make it about economics. But it, it's never the case for me. Even if immigrants were a net benefit to the economy, I would still be against non-European immigration. And I would say that there is really a much more important case to be made here against non-white immigration that I, I think is not stated so much because it's called politically incorrect or whatever. But I would say that, you know, and you've said that if there was something quantifiable or, or something for why we should exclude certain immigrants and not others, you would be okay with excluding them. Well, I would say probably the one of the bigger arguments for me is the historical precedent, which is to say that the people that founded the country were explicitly against 
non-white immigration, the people that founded the government, that gave the government its mandate. And I can read you, I mean, people that you'd be surprised by. I mean, uh, in the Constitution, it says, and this is the, the preamble, we the people of the United States, in order to, f- to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That's the crucial operative there. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So our founding document, mm-hmm. from which our government derives the mandate to act, It says that this government acts in the service of the posterity of the founding fathers and the people who founded the country in the 13 colonies. So how in good conscience can you say that it doesn't matter who comes into the country when the founding document that that gives our government a mandate to act says explicitly that it's the posterity of the nation, European in character, that this government was created for? Because I think when the— when our government was created, we were given the ability to amend our Constitution via the amendment right. process. And it seems like through the process of amending our Constitution, those values have slightly changed over time. The original document of our Constitution was never meant to be an unchanging, unyielding force. Uh, it seemed like we were given right off the bat, before it was even ratified, we were given the first 10 amendments to make changes to the Constitution or, or to add things as we see fit. And it seems like at this point in time, we don't agree that America should only be a white a Eurocentric place, and I mean that's where our constitution is at now. If we dramatically disagree, I guess we could try to revoke some amendments or add more amendments in the future. But well, I mean that's that's good. You know, the constitution was supposed to be amended; that was part of the process. But then I think you're conflating two things, which is popular opinion moving past the the founding mandate of the government, but you sort of combined it with the constitutional process. Can you point to me? In the constitutional amendments, of which there are 27, where it says that the original mandate, constitutional mandate for the government is not to serve the posterity of the founders. I know you can point to the 14th Amendment, which says that there is you can't discriminate based on color within the country. Uh Um, But where where in the constitutional amendments does it say that that we should bring in more people that are not of European origin. I don't I don't think that's in any of the amendments, is it? Well, the the Constitution is a limit on what the government can do. It, it tells right. specifically the government what it can do. So I wouldn't have to find an amendment that would say you can't, or I would ha- you would have to show me something of the Constitution that says we're not allowed to bring in immigrants. Without that, then you would assume that it's delegated to the states, c- correct? That's how our Constitution is set up? No, no, because, uh, you know, in Article 2 of the Constitution... Yeah, Article 2 of the Constitution, it gives the power of foreign affairs, of which the founders considered immigration, over to the president. And that's why the president has such broad powers to act on immigration. It's not its not a federal issue for the states to determine. That's, that's something explicitly in, in the control of the federal government. And it doesn't explicitly say in the preamble that we can't let in any other people, but implicitly the spirit of the founding mandate of the Constitution is the posterity. And if you don't believe me, that sounds like an extrapolation, correct? Mm-hmm. Well, if you don't believe me, and this is so important, John Jay wrote, John Jay was the first uh, chief Supreme Court justice in the United States in the first Federalist paper, which is, you know, I, if you're familiar with the Federalist papers, was John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. They wrote a series of essays to justify the, the new Constitution of the United States, which was up for ratification in 1787, got ratified in 1788. And John Jay wrote in the first Federalist paper this, and it's a pretty long quote, but I, I think it's important to establish. He said, quote, Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs. This country and this people seem to have been made for each other. So now I can understand why you would think it'd be shaky logic to say that the preamble, because it says we give this government to ourselves and our posterity, why that might exclude immigration. But in the first Federalist paper to justify the Constitution, John Jay, the first Supreme Court justice, explicitly lays out what posterity means, which is a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, the same religion, same principles of government, similar in manners and customs. So would you say that 
excluding an amendment to the Constitution, excluding a constitutional amendment, which is a pretty long process, and it was to get this Constitution passed, don't you think that it goes against the founding mandate of the country to fundamentally alter our immigration process to include the third world and, and make it all from the third world? I guess that might be a possibility. I don't know enough constitutional history to say. I guess I don't really consider like the original intention to some of the earliest founding like preambles or Federalist Papers in terms of like how we should conduct policy today. Um, I, I mean, I can't really argue with you here. I, I don't know. Like, I, I haven't read the Federalist Papers, and I don't know the intention behind every writer there. So it's possible that I mean, I, and not not even possible. It's probably probable that they would be like for like Eurocentric white America, whatever. Um, you know, descendants, language, religion, and all of that. That's entirely possible, sure. But I, I guess it's not where we're at right now today with our government. It doesn't seem to be how any of the government functions today. So I, I guess I just don't see the relevance in bringing up those original intentions. Sure. Well, you know, I, I think it is an important thing to address the the gravity of the original intent of the Constitution, because that is something that is up for debate, even by constitutional scholars. There is a significant wing in the Supreme Court, even, who would hold the same opinion that you do, that, that it is a, a living document, so to speak. And to make a case for, to make, albeit a brief case, for the original intent for the Constitution with regards to immigration, I would say that without a constitutional mandate for widespread social, uh, legal reform, I would say that, that anything is permitted. And in a hundred years, for example, this is not something I predict. This is not something that I think would even, would even happen. But hypothetically mm -hmm. in 100 years, if there's a radical social change, the Congress, if you take the living document at face value, the Congress could reinstitute slavery because even though it's against the constitution in a hundred years, and who knows what could be possible in 100 years, the Congress in itself, and we know the transient nature of Congress, could pass something that you might find morally reprehensible, whether that be slavery, whether that be uh, you know a Nazi state, whether that be something completely horrible, heinous. And the constitutional process was set up and put in place so that the amendment process would be deliberately slow and difficult. You need a convention. You need it to be ratified by two-thirds of the state or two-thirds of the Senate. I mean, it's a long process. It's difficult. You really need the will of the people behind you. And so I would challenge you and say, if the Congress can fundamentally change the demographics of the country, which is an important thing, and say that this is now a majority-minority country, this country now speaks half English and half Spanish, it's 14% Asian, it's 33% Hispanic, it's 14% black, and 40% white, what then is the limit to the power of a transient Congress, which lasts only two years and, and is subject to the, to the passions of the majority? So what exactly are you asking in terms of like what well, I'm asking like yeah sure so if if you if destiny system is that if we have quote unquote evolved beyond something that's in the constitution do you see no problem with things being drastic reform taking place with just a a congressional um bill just with with a 50% majority in the congress I mean, if that's how bills are passed, I mean, you always by living in a democracy, you accept that there are things that could be passed that you disagree with. I mean, no democracy can run where the will of every single individual person is represented. No. Well, no, but we're not we're not talking about the will. We're talking about the Constitution, which is what what are the limits of what a, and you yourself have said how the Congress is corrupt and they do bad things like they they fight wars in Iraq, which was unconstitutional. But I mean, you've acknowledged that the government is corrupt. It's pretty shady and and. When they're subject to the passions of a transient majority, they can do things that that aren't necessarily what the people would want. And and you're right. You know, you say, well, that's the democratic process. That's a democratic process. And that happens sometimes. But the founders of the country set up the Constitution and the government derives its powers from the Constitution said that to prevent that from happening. Legislation has to fit into the constraints of the Constitution, and they made it a very difficult process to change the Constitution so that those limits would to some extent be pretty concrete so that you couldn't have you couldn't have Nazi America because you would have to step outside the bounds of the Constitution. Either the passions of the majority would not last long enough to get an amendment through or it would be unconstitutional and could be shut down by the Supreme Court. So I guess I'm asking, do, do you not see a problem with the fact that we completely went against the Constitution with regards to immigration, and this like, is, this I guess is like a bad precedent. The problem is that, like, I, th this is kind of the problem that I'm having right now, is that the Constitution is a pretty decent document. There's a lot of language in there. 
for a lot of different things, and you're basing this whole thing on immigration on, on one word, on the posterity word. Like, other than that, I don't think the Constitution explicitly mentions immigration anywhere. But, like, because they said posterity in that one word, and then the Federalist Papers that exist that aren't part of government or the Constitution at all, you seem to think that from, like, that one thing you can derive that no immigration from other countries should ever be here. I, I, I'm having a really hard time, like, following. That seems like a huge extrapolation from, like, a single yeah. thing. No, and it is. And and allow me to justify it further. So this is the pre these are the first words of the Constitution where it says it says that the purpose of the government, why we established because, you know, they just broke off from the from King George. They just broke off from the British government and they you know, the Articles of Confederation failed. And so the people that signed the Constitution, it was ratified by two thirds of the state. Very difficult process. The preamble says why we have it is. In order to form a more perfect union, we want to establish justice, ensure tranquility, provide the common defense, promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. So, and I will I will justify it with more evidence. It says that we're establishing the whole reason that henceforth all this all this good language that comes forth from this constitution for this government is for the purpose of securing everything for ourselves and for our posterity. And the first Supreme Court justice, who I mean, that's they're they're charged with with writing or, or interpreting rather the intent of the Constitution. He wrote in the first Federalist paper to justify the Constitution exactly what posterity means. And it is European Christians. And so Further, Thomas Jefferson, he wrote in a letter to George Washington in, in 1786, he wrote, quote, nothing is more certainly written in the book of fate than that these people, African slaves, are to be free, nor is it less certain that the two races equally free cannot live in the same government. And you saw in the Naturalization Act of 1790, 1795, and 1798, that immigration was restricted to free white persons of good character. So you have you have three legislative acts in the first 30 years of the government. You have the the writer of the Declaration of Independence, the first Supreme Court justice in the first Federalist paper, and the preamble of the Constitution, all basically setting forth this precedent that this country is not for anyone else other than European Christians. And you know, you may disagree with that, but then why should you not have to go through the constitutional process to change that? I guess I don't necessarily disagree with that. I, I mean, it sounds like you know a fair bit about this. If that was their intentions back then, that's that's then that can be their intentions back then. I guess I'm just not usually too concerned with like what were the exact intentions behind some of the people 200 plus years ago. I'm more concerned with policy that's affected today and what's going on today with where we stand at government. And it seems like nobody else in government holds these like specific views anymore so I, I just don't see the relevance i guess unless you want to argue about it from straight if we were having like strictly a constitutional debate on what does the constitution allow the federal government to do in so far as immigration then uh, of course i would admit you're right i i guess based on this but i guess i'm just not seeing the relevance to what we're talking about in terms of today's issues in the united states well i mean the relevance is that if the Congress tomorrow, you know, if if this Trump hysteria was real, and I imagine you were against Trump, correct? Uh, yeah, pretty pretty heavily, yeah. Okay, so you're heavily against Trump. I, I okay, so let's. I I dislike hypotheticals, but I think it's especially important for the Constitution because so much of what the founders put in place, whether you think they were like old racists and crusty people or not, they they made a pretty I think sober judgment about how a government should act. And so that's why hypotheticals oh. are important. If President Trump gets elected and it's, uh, you know, it's 2016, he has his Republican House, his Republican Senate, he stuffed the Supreme Court with conservative justices. And he says tomorrow that Muslims in the country have to wear a special badge. And there was a lot of like, there's a lot of hysteria during the election that he said that he never said that, but hype, you know, and this is an example, I think that, that I think you can understand if President Trump tomorrow passed sweeping legislation, he had the mandate from the people and Paul Ryan's on the same page. He's not. But hypothetically, he is. Mm -hmm. And they pass legislation that Muslims have to wear badges. They're second class citizens. The Constitution would protect against that. But if according to your standard and standards are very important, I'm, I'm notice I'm not getting into the consequentialist, so to speak. I'm getting into more the systemic, the precedent that it sets this would be completely acceptable under your system, which is that, well, whatever, you know, because it's an imperfect representative democracy, well, whatever the Congress does, because it's a sign of the times and the Constitution is old, well, that can happen. I mean, do you not see a problem with that? 
Do you not see a middle ground anywhere between every single letter of the Constitution must be followed as it was originally written versus anything can go? I think there are middle grounds that we exist in today. We have our interpretation of the Constitution and a lot of constitutional law given to us by the Supreme Court, by legislatures of our current understanding of law. I think there's a middle ground here. That Okay, well, well, what is the... I mean, like... So for them I, to do I, that, yeah. it sounds like they would have to sure. roll back things like protected classes. They would have to go through a lot of work. Um, probably this would pro to give special badges to people would probably take an amendment. I mean, if they had a majority everywhere, maybe they could they could rule and get it. It's possible they could get it, but I, I don't agree that the only two positions can be absolute strict letter of the law view of everything versus absolutely nothing matters and Congress can do whatever they want. I think there's a middle ground here. Yeah, and, and I understand it's a heavy handed thing to say. I, I believe it. I understand it might be heavy handed, but but then. You understand that your reasoning is a little bit shaky here, this sort of like, well, you know, maybe this is OK. Maybe they need majorities. And this is all very pretty shaky. I'm asking you, because if there is a middle ground, I want to hear it. I mean, what would be the standard that would differentiate so transforming like, okay, the so, demographics of the country and so let me use badges? A, let me use a real example. OK, and, and then, I'll, and then okay. I'll speak to your immigration thing. So sure. Or, or we'll do the immigration. Well, I'll do the real example first. OK, so I think that in my opinion and. It sounds like you know more about constitutional law than I do. In my opinion, mm -hmm. I think that the ACA, as much as I'm for it insofar as its pragmatic implementation, was probably something that should have required some sort of amendment to pass. I don't understand how the government can mandate me to purchase something and then fine it and call it a tax. That seems like bullshit to me. I feel like that needed some sort of amendment to pass. I don't agree that that was able to slide by. When we right. talk about immigration, we have hundreds of years of, of law that seems to disagree with this very original single word that you're pointing to. So it, it like, w w I mean, legal precedent is very important insofar as how our law functions. So when you have right. all this law that goes into making something a certain way, I'm more likely to believe the current day interpretation than to say, well, let's look back 250 years ago, what they said when they first wrote the document, because it seems like that's not very relevant anymore. That well, okay. Yeah. And yeah, is that are you going to make another analogy or was well, no, that I, just... I guess so so for something like um let's say that for the healthcare thing right let's say that we <laughs> had had for um, for hundreds of years or maybe even hundreds of years in the future we will what where the government starts mandating you to purchase private things right well if because mm -hmm. I think the Supreme Court ruled that the mandate was okay um, if we continue to get rulings like that you know 100 years from now that's just kind of an accepted part of government then that the legal precedent is so strong that you can't just go back to you know 1990 and go, well, look, the government didn't do this then. Well, at that point, it's a little bit irrelevant, right? You kind of have to go by the legal precedent that's been established up to that point. So, yeah, so so the ACA as it stands now would be something that I would be opposed to on a constitutional basis and, and in, insofar as what the government has the power to do. But when you're talking about something like immigration that's got hundreds of years of legal precedent backing up where we are now, I have a much harder time saying, well, let's go back, let's roll the clock back, if that makes sense. Does it? So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. And, um, you know, the Obamacare example is interesting. The, the Obamacare example, the constitutional disagreement is is a private property thing, but mm -hmm. and it's a it's a amendment number 10 thing. That is to say that the Constitution, it's arguable whether the Constitution lays out specifically, enumerates specifically the right to force someone to buy insurance, Man, like you yeah. said, which, which is bullshit, you know, obviously. And number two, that the government can provide spending for healthcare, And this is welfare in general, that in Article 1, Section 8, it says what what provisions the government can spend money on constitutionally. And and the difference is that in the language of Article 1, Section 8, it says the general welfare. It says you can spend money on X, Y and Z. It says very specifically. And then it says and anything to ensure the general welfare. Now, mm -hmm. Many people have said that the general welfare, and this was the original intent, was the general welfare would be an affirmation of the previous item, saying X, Y, and Z, and anything else to assist X, Y, and Z. But there is, I think, a reasonable way that you can interpret general welfare to say social safety net, to say that is in addition to the previous measures. With immigration, there doesn't exist the wiggle room. And so I think that's where we can find a middle ground in terms of you can interpret the language to a pretty reasonable extent with fiscal matters, with certain other matters. But with immigration, it says very specifically in the law, ourselves and our posterity. And, you know, the Federalist Papers are not law. But if we're looking at intent of the law, you don't have the same precedent that you do with Article 1, Section 8. It doesn't really exist where they say you can never have a social safety net because that didn't exist in 1788. But there was very clear there was a very clear intent for the 
preamble, which said what posterity means, and and there's really no wiggle room on this one. So I agree, you know, so, there is there is middle ground. We have like, that, but not with this issue. It's it, so it's this. It's kind of sounds to me like we're it's almost like a discussion on communism, where somebody will give me all of these reasons why communism could be great, or it could be awesome, or it could be cool. And these are like at least insofar as my channel, I'm not usually interested in arguing with people about the tenets of communism because it seems like such an incredibly unlikely, unrealistic thing that I'm just not usually concerned with with having those arguments. If we were okay. having an argument on the const the the um, original interpretation, constitutional um, view of these issues, then that would be a discussion. But this is a discussion that I've never had before, and I'm not really interested okay. in it because. And I think we both agree on this point. You don't. This is never going to happen, right? Nobody is ever going to get up in Congress and go, "Well, look at the word posterity here, and here are the Federalist Papers, and everything we've ever thought about immigration is wrong." This is never going to happen, right? You understand that, right? Uh, no, I I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that exactly. And certainly Donald Trump ran on a platform that was expli well implicitly pro-white, explicitly anti-immigration. Now he might have the he might not have the constitutional gravitas or or education to phrase it this way, but I think you're seeing a growing electorate in America and certainly in Europe, which is saying that these governments, whether you're for immigration or not, do not have the mandate to change countries, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether there's a vote or not, that these countries remain as they were unless you really have a popular mandate. So I, I don't agree with that premise, that this is not an impractical thing. I think that's ex that's exactly what the question is. I mean, the the poor people in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, that are being displaced by illegal immigrants, maybe it's economic for them. But certainly for someone like me, when I drive 15 minutes east down Ogden Avenue in Chicago and I end up in, in Little Village and everywhere all the signs are in Spanish, all the all the uh, restaurants are, are Mexican, everyone speaks Spanish, it's all Mexicans, I wouldn't, I don't care so much about the economics. And I think for a lot of people, it's it's more about who is this country for? Who is who is this country built for? What's the mandate? And if you're going to change it, you need you need that precedent. You need to fundamentally alter the laws with the will of the people and not just like legislative fiat. So I I mean that's where I I hope you understand the significance of that. This is I not mean, like I understand. I'm just saying I'm that, not going with semantic stuff. No, I understand. I'm just saying that in so like as of today, not I, I haven't heard of a single federal congressman or federal senator or anybody involved with government suggest that the United States needs to roll back its immigration policy 200 years. I haven't heard this as a suggestion. If it started to be like a hotly contested thing, then I, I would probably be more interested in diving into the topic. But I, but it just seems like this is so... I've never heard anybody, any elected official, bring this up before. It just doesn't seem very realistic. Like, this is an issue that we're going to be talking about in the next, you know, six years or seven years of uh, the Trump's presidency, the next president, whatever's going on. If it started oh, well, to I be mean, brought up, like then, then I, I would be, I would dig into it more. But I don't know. Like I said, I've just, I've never heard anybody bring up, the, you know, these kinds of arguments before, and so far as why immigration shouldn't exist in the way that it does today. Or at least, no elected official has. Sure. Well, well, then I guess you know if we can move along from this because, and and in fairness, you didn't you didn't prepare for a constitutional debate, so I won't I won't beat you over the head. I I hate when people do that when they come at you with a subject that they know about and and you you know didn't even get the memo that that was going to be there. So. You know, sure, we could we could pass over that for now, um, and we could just talk strictly about immigration and the racial component there. But I would I would just ask you, you look around the world today, um, and I've studied African politics. I don't want you to, to think I'm some kind of bigot or racist or like I just look at Africa and I go like it sucks. Like you know, just from an uneducated perspective. But you look at Africa and it's uniquely like the worst place in the world to live. And it has been for 3,000 years. And you look at Latin America, very corrupt, very poor, lots of violence. You look at Asia, and certainly there's corruption, there's drug trafficking, they have their problems, not to the same extent as Africa and, and Latin America, but they have them. And I'm wondering, do you see all these people from all these different worlds, and this is sort of like a can you honestly believe this, which I, I don't like those questions, but I mean, tell me why it doesn't matter from where our immigrants come from. Tell me why it doesn't matter whether we get them from the Congo or from France. I mean, is there no difference in your mind between those people? How often are people immigrating from the Congo to the United States that aren't in like the upper echelons of society? How often is like a criminal from the Congo finding his way into the United States? Well, I mean, you could take the the Sudanese uh, immigrant, Emmanuel Sampson, who just shot up a church in Tennessee. He was from Africa. 
Okay, that's and, one uh, and now now one person is dead and six are wounded. Well, I mean, you don't even have to look at Africa, but she can even look at at Asian and, and Latin American immigration. Sure. I mean, if we could take a, a better example, because you're right, the majority of immigration now comes from Latin America. Mm-hmm. But do you do you see no difference then in quality between an immigrant from Nicaragua and El Salvador and an immigrant from Paris, France or from London, England? So I guess that the um, this is difficult because I usually talk about this in, in, in an economic lens, because that's usually what yeah. I'm most concerned with. Um, but but we but you don't want to talk about the economic issue. So I guess um, the the way that I would look at a, a particular immigrant is I would hope that the country has some measure in place. Like if somebody is coming from a country and they have like a record of like fifteen convicted rapes or something, right? This is not somebody right. that we would let into the country. But the but the letting people in or not would be based on their background, not necessarily their ethnicity or cultural origin or any, or their religion or anything like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. More of a, like a background check thing as opposed to a national origin. Yeah. And then I, w- I would ask you as a, a follow up. I mean, this is really sort of the question of racial determinism. And I know you were pretty offended uh, on John Tron's statement that he was fixated on race and he talked about an ethno state and all of that. And I'm not I'm not for an ethno state. I I think simply that America should retain a racial majority that is European. That's not an ethnic, that's a racial component, and it should be a majority. Not that there should be no blacks, not that there should be no Hispanics. I'm Hispanic myself, but that there should be a a racial majority. And I, I guess what I'm asking is, do you believe that if you have a nation that is majority minority or majority Hispanic or majority Asian, and certainly the demographics can change in the next 200 years, do you think it will remain the same country that it was when it was European? Probably not, but I don't think any country is the same country that it was 50 years ago. Every there, There's no, I don't know, maybe Russia I don't, or maybe China. Some, mm, definitely not China. Not, not insofar as the way they function. The people there live much differently than they did 50 years ago. I think the culture probably well, maybe, changed. Maybe superficially, but I mean, do they still have significant influences from Confucian culture? Do they still have a, a single steady bloodline back to their ancestors? Does the Great Wall still stand? Do they still respect their elders? I mean, is there still a collective mentality? Sure, certainly the sure. trappings the, have changed. Yeah, but does but the things, country remain the same? The, the, I mean, you, you maintain similarities, but I think every country has, has changed quite a bit over the past 50 years as we've entered the 20th century. Technology and the Internet has changed everything. Um, in so far, like you can step into any country now and find English speaking people everywhere. Um, it, cultures have, have mended or not mended, but have kind of like molded together a lot because of the um, distribution of entertainment from Hollywood to all over the world. We share a lot of the same music now. Um, I think every country has changed. This idea that some countries don't change or can hold on to something and not change. Like, I don't think culture works like that ever. Throughout all of human history, culture has always been changing and evolving. I see. I, I disagree with that proposition. I think that's the key difference is that. You're saying that, well, 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 all countries change. Everything changes all the time. And, you know, if that were the case, I, I think I might be more sympathetic. But what we're seeing in the world right now with this this 21st century thing, which I agree is is a a rapid transformation. We've never seen anything like it in the history of the world where you have true globalism in communication and trade, commerce, migration. But, you know, what I often say on my show is that the demographic change, which is different than a cultural change. A, a cultural change is something like in Persia, where they adopt Islam instead of Zoroastrianism, but it's still Persian. Or, or a country like Egypt adopts um, Islam. That's actually a bad example, as they also brought in a fair amount of Arabs. But you know, a country like China can remain characteristically Chinese, and the trappings change, but underlying it stays the same. And certainly that is racial, ethnic, and, and something that is cultural within a, in a biological component. But I would say that When you say that, well, everything's changing, it's really not the case. Only white countries, only European descended countries are undergoing this rapid demographic transformation and expected to do so. I mean, you look at the the movement of peoples and do you see many Europeans transforming the demographics of Mexico or of uh, northern Africa or of China or or even Japan? I I don't think so. And so I would say that, that our beef it's not a racist thing. It's not like, well, you know, we don't want people because they look different from us, but we have a culture. We have we have bloodlines. We have people that were here before us that built the country, and seemingly we're the only ones that are expected to undergo this multicultural transformation. I mean, why are you not holding every other country in the world to the standard? So this kind of sounds like the why aren't more women 
uh, dying on the job if we want true equality argument? Like, no, not so necessarily. When people make that argument, people people say we want uh, more even representation of women and men in fields, and then somebody will inevitably go, well, what about women don't go to coal sites and die all the time? Like, that's not fair. Well, okay, we don't want anybody to go to coal sites and die. We're not trying to make those, we're not trying to increase uh, the amount of people that are having to work jobs that, you know, wind up with you getting killed. So when we talk about countries and you talk about how we don't expect other countries to undergo these demographic shifts, I mean, typically today, it seems like um, whether it's from imperialism or whatever you want to whatever you want to accredit it to, white countries are usually the ones that are doing the best all around the world. So we don't I, I mean, if there were a ton of white people trying to immigrate to like Sudan or Chad or Kenya or someplace like this, then I, I guess maybe there would be these issues. But we don't really see this happening. People tend to not want to immigrate into these countries. So when you say like we don't expect these countries to have demographic shifts, well, that's because nobody's trying to go to those countries. Um, well, I, I, well, why aren't they? Why aren't they going to those countries? Usually because those countries suck. Why? Why do they suck? Um, it can be a combination of very corrupt government, depending on what part of the world you're talking about. It could be a lack of economic opportunity. Um, the economic opportunity okay. available in a lot of Western world countries is usually far greater than in a lot of these other countries. Um, I, I don't know. It could be because of, um, if you're talking about Mexico, maybe things like crime, maybe things like, um, right. <clears throat> depending on what kind of organizations exist there. I, I mean, I don't know. There's a plethora of reasons. Sure. Well, I, the reason I ask is because, we look around the world at countries, like you said, that suck and, and we're not going there. And the reason that we're not going there is because those countries don't work. And I don't understand how you can divorce the people coming from those countries from the countries they came from. I mean, Mexico, this is according to Transparency International, is the 93rd most corrupt, excuse me, <laughs> 93rd most corrupt country in the world, twice as corrupt as the United States. Now, you look at Africa. 3,000 years of failure, not one successful city. We arrived there in 1880, not one two-story building, not one written language except for Ethiopia. They, they didn't even have impersonal government. Some places hadn't even invented the wheel. And you say that that uniformity of, of failure, of civilizational failure, is in no way, shape, or form the responsibility of the people in those countries? I guess when we talk about things like responsibility of the people, like these aren't usually questions that I'm usually concerned about, like this idea of forcing Why somebody not? to say something, because it doesn't really get us anywhere. It doesn't really move well, us sure towards any, has it in the past 3,000 years? It has. It has. You and, just and said I'll they haven't had why. a single two-story building in the entire country when, when we got up there to the 1800s or whatever, and that there's still a, it's still a shithole apparently, so it, it seemingly hasn't worked so far, no? Well, I'll tell you why. Here's why. It's because... It's, it's a shithole for a reason. And if we want to prevent our countries from looking like Africa or our countries from looking like Mexico or our countries from looking like Indonesia, maybe we should stop taking in Africans and Mexicans and Indonesians, correct? I mean, that that's what I'm fundamentally getting at here is that we seem to always start in the middle of the equation where there's com some countries that are poor and some countries that are rich and everyone should go to the rich ones. Well, you know, we didn't get there out of it wasn't like luck that we became the richest, most successful, least corrupt countries in the world. It had something to do with the people that were here. I mean, th there's no coincidence well, the people why that immigrated here. But yeah, well, yeah, the people that immigrated here from the other richest countries in the world. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, Germany, Britain, um, Spain, uh, France. I mean, these were the wealthiest, most advanced countries in the world. And they came here and, and they colonized and they set up a prosperous, successful country. And and now I, I here's the question is you believe in this egalitarianism where you just have this sort of very easy indifference to who's coming in. And maybe that's easy for you. But for people that like want to see our country thrive, how can you say that it'll have no effect whether we bring in millions of Mexicans who have had a failure of a country for thousands of years and millions of Frenchmen or Englishmen or Germans who for a thousand years have had remarkably successful countries and in the past 500 years, the most, uniquely the most and by far the best countries? So – when you talk about a destroyed country, you talk about a country that has a lot of problems. First of all, we're, we're, we've already moved past the fact that African countries are joining the first world at like record rates, like faster uh, than... Are they? Yeah, birth rates have fallen dramatically in a lot of these countries. Well, then why well, aren't people moving to them if they're like... Because these they're still growing because the Western world is still better. You know this. Okay, so the, the African countries yeah. have largely been improving and joining us in, so, in regards to birth rates, in regards to medicine, in regards to access to education and other sort of job opportunities. So it's not like they're in the same place they were hundreds of years ago. A lot of this has been a combination of us not 
abusing the countries as much and also helping the countries for aid and, and, and other types of joint, well, I don't know, whatever we do in terms of working with other countries. It seems to be working. They seem to be joining the first world at pretty pretty record paces. You can look up like the birth rates of any of these countries and see that they've sloped off pretty dramatically and they're approaching Western birth rates. Um, firstly, secondly, when you talk about countries that have a lot of problems, right, usually these problems are the result of a very, very, very difficult to change structure. So if we look at something like Mexico, right, you might look at the structure of the cartels, you might look at the structure of their economy, you might look at the job opportunities available, you might look at the, um, the government's inability to control certain things. Just because people come to another country doesn't necessarily mean they're going to bring their broken structures with them. Like if we, you know, I don't think that a thousand Mexicans um, coming over to the United States looking for work to escape the cartels are going to build a cartel in the United States. Like I, I think that that's a pretty one-dimensional view of, of why people would immigrate away from a country or, or immigrate to the United States in the first place. Sure. Well, so to answer your first point, you say mm -hmm. that, you know, Africa is like rapidly, you know, they're, they're so close. They're so close to a breakthrough. And, you know, in five years, it's going to be Britain. It's going to be Hong Kong. I didn't I, say you in know, five years it was going to be Britain no, I, or Hong I know, Kong because they I'm, don't have third world countries to like dramatically abuse. Like, sure. Okay, okay, sure. A little bit of satire there, but uh, you know, it's it sort of it sort of is a a contradiction and a non sequitur because the very problem we're talking about is why they're fleeing these countries. I mean, certainly, I think you would imagine that if these countries were accelerating at the rate you're talking about to first world status and the medicine, fertility rates are getting better. I don't think people would be making a harrowing journey across the Sahara Desert and and jumping into a raft on the Libyan coast and try to swim across the Mediterranean Ocean. It wouldn't be this dramatic, impossible escape if they were like on the cusp. There there is a long gulf there that I, I don't think is inevitable. You you seemingly made the supposition that because they have this trajectory, because they've gone from like very, very terrible to just very terrible, that they're on this this uninterrupted trajectory towards maybe you didn't say that but it certainly seems like it where and and additionally you say that they're on the cusp because we help them which is kind of key and so so that's the first point is is you it's sort of a non sequitur that people are making these impossible escapes from from countries that are that are head and shoulders worse than western countries and then secondly I don't think Mexicans are coming here to start drug cartels. I think Mexicans come here and they start drug cartels. It's not, It's a difference between, as we were talking earlier, between the intention and the result, which is to say that, you know, you have this idea of Mexicans and then they're hardworking. They come here for opportunities. And OK, sure. But if I go down to Cicero or I go down to Tinley Park, where these are neighborhoods in Chicago, I'll get killed by a, a drunk Mexican if I'm driving like any time between eight o'clock and, and like two in the afternoon. I mean, realistically, where there's drug cartel violence in, in Pilsen and Little Village, where 50 years ago there, there was no kind of thing like that. So I would say that, you know, number one, okay, you wouldn't have immigration problems if they were advancing. So and number at two. Well, just very specifically looking at that, like, I, I'm not saying that no Mexican that comes to the United States will never commit crime. I think that's an unreasonable standard to place on any group of people. Every... I'm not saying I'm not saying that there's they're the only ones and they, they solely commit crimes, but certainly it is it is specifically a problem with Hispanic immigrants. I mean, I, I have never seen Africa. those numbers before in my entire life. Every number that I've ever seen that speaks of crime that separates Hispanics from whites always shows that Hispanics are, are underrepresented in terms of crime committed in the United States. I've never seen any stats that contradict that. There might be so, specific areas of, of Mexican crime, I guess, but there are specific areas of probably German, Russian, any white people crime and black crime, of course, as well. I, I, that doesn't exist. And and here and here's here's wait, kind of the doesn't difference exist? is like. That doesn't the sort of white crime you're talking about. John Tron brought it up on, on your show, in fact, where he said that the the poorest white communities have less crime than the, the richest black community. So I, this this yeah, sort this of is a picture well, that I'm floats sure around poll that compares two cities in the United States. I'm not interested in this type of data that, that takes well, show two me where there's. Show me where there's white crime. I mean, where is there a hotbed of white crime that is like infamous? Because I could think of many Hispanic and black hotbeds of crime. Where's the white Hot I mean, we can talk about, like, the methamphetamine shit that destroys, like, the entire Midwest. Like, there's a ton of drug-related shit that goes on in, in my neck of the woods in the United States. Are you saying that white people don't commit crime in the United States? No. No, and I think that's actually a straw man. What I'm saying is the immigrants that we're bringing in, it, it seems to be specifically a problem with them. I mean, you, I don't think you would argue 
that, well, number one, most of the drugs come from Mexico, with the exception of the designer drugs. Those come from Asia and, and Canada, the Asian drug gangs in Canada. But certainly I don't think you would disagree with the fact that most of the cocaine and heroin and marijuana comes from the southern border. You wouldn't argue against that, would you? Probably not. But I mean, it's consumed by okay. people in the United States. Naturally, naturally. But the people that are that are bringing it here, they're they're coming from south of the border. And the people that are bringing it are Mexican and like Tijuana um, is one example that comes to mind. Los Angeles, violent, violent cities in, in Chicago as well. I yeah, mean, they're bringing them there to is, white people to to consume. Do you think that the Mexicans yeah, brainwash the white people to want the drugs? No, no. Um, but but here's the difference is you look at like. I, I have the same problem in my neck of the woods. Heroin overdoses, um, you have a massive marijuana, you know, it's it's easily available, illegal and illicit substances, but you don't see the violence. You don't see the violence that is associated with that, that you see, because when I talk about the drug gangs, it's the gangs and the violence. Certainly drugs have, illicit substances have always been a problem, but in particular, it's, it's the gangs and the violence, which you see almost exclusively from Hispanics. And certainly there is, there is white crime, uh, drug crime as well, but this seems to be, even though we're the outsized uh, by a far majority, um, higher percentage of the population, we see a, a disproportionate amount of violent crime from Hispanics. And I don't have to pull up a study for, for you to understand that if you go into the Mexican part of Chicago, you'll get shot easily than you would be in the white part of Chicago, right? In that one hyper-specific city, yeah, sure. Okay, but... and in Los Angeles, and in New York City, and in the big cities in Texas, and in New Mexico, and in Arizona. I mean, point to me where this is not the case. Bismarck, <laughs> North Dakota, I mean, where is this happening? I mean, happening? the majority of Hispanics that come to the United States and don't go and live in some of like the worst ghettos in the United States, it seems like this isn't much of a problem. Doesn't this point to a geographic problem more so than a look at these Hispanics? Like, No. No, I, I don't see how that would have anything. Even though to do you with. just had to name these specific cities that have the toughest cities and the worst ghettos, you had to name like six specific cities. That doesn't sound which, like which more. Also, yeah, which also, by the way, have the highest percentage of Mexican immigrants. This is—I didn't pull this out of my butt. I mean, if you look at DACA, if you look at the legal immigration numbers, the vast majority of Hispanics go to New York and they go to California and they go to the, the big cities. That's where immigrants go to. That's where the jobs are. So, it and I'm again, I'm not saying it's. It's all Mexicans or even it's most Mexicans that are participating in crime. But most of the violent crime is Mexicans, is people from. And again, I mean, this is one this is one slice of the problem. But I'm speaking more broadly to say that problems that are systemic in third world countries show up in first world countries, which is to say that, you know, this horrible, horrible drug sort of thing that has existed in, in the Hispanic world for a long, long time has just now shown up because of the Mexicans in this country. And certainly the the Muslim African rape gangs in Europe have just started to appear when the Muslim Africans showed up. And so I'm saying that there are these differences between immigrant groups that, that we cannot afford to be indifferent as to who's coming in. That's what I'm saying. Sure. So even the Muslim rape gangs in, in Europe weren't Muslim rape gangs. Usually these people were coming from like North African Muslim countries. Like there was a very sure. specific like area that they were immigrating from. It wasn't just all Muslims that came and started these rape gangs. This okay, is, but I mean, were there <laughs> are they European rape gangs? So it, it or are they North African? Sure, sure, maybe North African. And I don't know what the vetting process is like for every European country. It seemed like there was a problem with people that came from Northern African countries, for, based on the data that I read. But but I guess like when we have these conversations, it seems like a baby in the bathwater thing. Like, are there some problems in the United States with crime? Yeah, for sure. Are there some people that immigrate here and maybe move to these areas where they commit crime? Yeah, sure. But this idea that because there are these problems, we need to get rid of all of immigration that just seems like such an extreme reaction like, like you get out you get rid of all the positives and then you in order to take care of some problems that you have in the united states it seems like a really ill-conceived idea sure well well two two things to address that um you know number one you're right sounds extreme you know relatively minor crime problem uh relative to the gross domestic product that increases i would contend that if you were an american citizen you know say you're a father and I hope this is not an anecdotal emotional appeal, but it, it speaks to the principle of the matter uh -huh. that if you have ancestry going way back into the country and your ancestors have you know, built the railroads and they built the buildings and they worked in the factory lines and they fought and died in the wars, they were conscripted into World War II. And so you feel like you've made a really big investment and your, your lineage has in this country and you're a father and you've paid Social Security all your life, you've contributed and your child 
is raped or killed. And this is not an emotional appeal. It is to say that it sounds extreme, but when one American life is sacrificed because we want foreign people to, to be materially more wealthy, it's fundamentally a bad principle to go off of. And I'll let you respond to that, but that's number well, one. I mean, my kid goes to school, so the highest chance yeah. he's got of getting killed is by another white kid showing up at school and shooting the place up. Like, this is, this is things well, that white that's people do. Well, that's in 2017. But it, by 2065, you then, think and again, you are know, going to go to sh- schools and shoot them up like white kids do? <laughs> yes. Um, well, that's that's beside the point. But, I mean, to the point, I mean, a white person that shoots up a school is someone else that's been here. You're not. You're never going to avoid all crime. But, but if you're that's the argument that you're making, that if a single American life is killed, and now when I point out yes. that white people shoot yes. up schools, now you're saying you can't avoid all crime? Killed, killed by another American. You can never erase why does crime that make it better? domestically. Here's why it makes a difference, because— Bringing in people from a foreign country, if we can stop all foreign people coming from all foreign countries, you eliminate all casualties from foreign crime. There's there's no way that you can ever get a, a grip. I mean, you can have better or worse policies domestically in a country, but you'll always have crime from your own people, short of being a totalitarian country. And even then, you'll have you'll have externalities for that. But all crime is preventable from foreign people. It, if your kid got killed by an illegal immigrant, you would feel especially gypped because that was that was supposed to be prevented. But if you, your kid got killed by a legal immigrant in a drunk driving accident or a, a drug gang killing, you might not be as pissed off, but you could say at least that we could better control who's coming in or better yet make it so that that could never happen. But I mean, I'll let you respond to that in detail, but that was that's number one. And then well, number two, okay. this is this is related. This is related. Number two, as you said, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I, I hear this a lot. I would ask, what is who is the baby? What is the baby? You, you act like we're throwing out all this like rich, like good material. We're throwing out all this great stuff with all the bad stuff. But outside of like maybe the economy grows, uh, you know, maybe you have cheaper consumer goods. I mean, what what is the benefit that justifies even one American life that you have people coming here to this country? Now, I recognize immigrants will, will benefit from coming here. But what do the people in this country benefit that excluding them because of their crime would be so costly, an opportunity cost, I suppose. And you can answer those two points. Sure. So for the first one, in terms of like, what if your kid was killed by an immigrant? Like, this just seems like such a bizarrely, um, I, I can't even like fathom. I mean, like, what if your kid was killed by like the descendant of an Irishman or Italian? Like, w- would you say that like they should have never been allowed to stay in the United States, that we should have kept the policy that keeps them out? Or, or what if people or people that legally immigrated here in the like the 30s or 40s and then had kids should i feel bad if my kid gets killed by one of them like that's i can't even like fathom like man if only we kept all the immigrants out forever like that would have been a way to keep my kid from getting murdered what if my kid gets killed by somebody that goes to jail for marijuana use and then he gets out of jail and then later on he kills my kid like should i be thinking like man if only we kept every single person that used marijuana locked up for life this would have never happened like this just seems like such an extreme argument that 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 would never hold up if you applied it to any other thing than, than immigrants. Um, and then also we, we completely ignore the flip side of that. What if my kid, um, what if my kid comes out of, of school with a business degree and he wants to start a business, but he can't because there's no labor pool around because he can't hire people because the cost of labor is so high because there's nobody here to work. Or what if you have a city and you've got people that are going out of business because nobody's moving there because the population is shrinking or whatever. Maybe some of these people get depressed and either end up killing themselves or they go back and they move in with their parents. Like, do they then blame the government for not letting enough immigrants in? Do they get angry at, at white people in general for not letting like this? just seems like such a weird kind of argument Do you understand Do you want to address yeah no i, I get where you're coming from and uh yeah so to answer if, we're, if we'll take it point by point to answer your first point on and that's a good point citizens that immigrated here before and citizens from italy or ireland it goes back to the mandate of the country it also goes back to risk if we're to avoid the constitutional thing for a moment which is it's pretty important but if we can avoid it I, there are other ways around that it has to do with risk factor, which is to say that, and I don't think anyone would argue against me on this, that we are making less of a risk by bringing in 68% European immigrants than bringing in 70% Hispanic, African, and Latin American immigrants. I don't think anyone would contend that African and Latin American countries are more safe or less violent than European countries. Sure, so but we just number spoke one about, is, you spoke about opportunity costs, right? By not bringing in low skill labor, there are parts of American businesses that lose out on access to that as well. Like that is a loss. 
it's not it's not like high school labor is the only thing that can come in and, and benefit a country. Low skill labor is an important part of of the American country as well as of every Western country. Well, yeah, and then, and then you get over to if you don't bring in that immigration, well, then you know, boo hoo, my my American kid's not going to be able to start a business. But I I think you would agree that someone being murdered is different than someone not being able to start a business. This no, that's has to not do with true negative at all. Positive. No, I don't agree. I don't agree with that at all. We accept risks even of depth, for death a lot of the time for economic reasons. Look at automobiles. What, 60 or it's like 30 or 60,000 people a year die in automobiles just to travel from point A to point B quicker? Like I could rephrase that same question to you. Like, do you think it's okay that people travel quicker and it ends up killing almost 100,000 people a year in the United States, including women and children? This is horrible. Like, well, no, we accept these trade-offs all the time as long as they're not well, grossly... What's represent sure, well what's the trade-off what's the trade-off what do we get in return for accepting this risk you get the resource of labor coming to your country okay well i mean and then i guess that's the value judgment that people have to make which is to say are we okay with with many americans dying at the hands of high-risk immigrants from high-risk countries you say so high that risk but that number hasn't been demonstrated goods. like mexicans don't sure. commit crimes uh, like 10 times higher than like the native white people that doesn't happen like the, the crime stats between between whites and hispanics are pretty close i think hispanics may be a little bit higher but it's pretty close in terms of how many people commit crimes so it seems like you have about are you talking much- about are you talking about proportions or are you talking about net proportions okay I, I don't think that's true with proportions but I mean you could look at the you could look at the statistics on prisons and largely many of the statistics have, have stopped being published but I, I don't think that's the case I mean especially you look at uh, you know Africans in in Europe this is not the case I know we're not we're not talking about Europe but I mean certainly immigration generally speaking you can see that some countries are higher risk than other countries I mean you understand this right sure. I mean, you would. I don't think you would say that if we were to take ten Mexican immigrants and ten German immigrants, that the ten Germans would be as likely as as the Mexicans to be committing crimes. I mean, if no, you're scooping, of course the- not. But you also have like a huge selection okay. bias here as well, right? Like, if you're getting immigrants from coming across the the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, right? If you're getting people from China, you're getting people from Europe. Like, these are people that are already in the upper echelons of society versus the people that are immigrating from Mexico. It takes a lot to get over here. From one of those countries. So when you say like take ten German citizens, these aren't people that can just run across the border. These are people that have to be come from an educated family or a well off family such that they can afford flights to send their children to go to the United States. Like your selection by you're already picking like the top ten percent of the society, right? Not necessarily, because even you see, you know, like I said with that that Sudanese person that shot up Tennessee, I mean, certainly he wasn't excluded from Sure, but this is one person. Here. Like, we don't get a lot of suit. Like, if you see, if you're in the United States and you see, like, uh, like somebody from, like, um, from, like, Nigeria or somebody from, like, mm-hmm. Kenya or something, like, this is probably yeah. a very educated person from a very well-off family. Chances are, right? This is why Asians do so well, like, in all of our universities, right? Because if you're- I don't know if that's why. Okay, well, ignoring maybe you believe there's a genetic component, but like even if there is a genetic component, right? Asians, if they're in the United States to study, you're not getting the poor Asian dude from his village that you know really wants to go to America to study. You're getting the richest, wealthiest, most educated people in China who have the money to send their child overseas to one of our universities, right? So the chances of you getting shot by a Chinese person on the street is very, very, very low because Chinese people like that aren't coming to the United States, you know? Okay. Well, and, you know, we could disagree about the crime statistics. Certainly, I think that if you come from an Hispanic country, you're more predisposed to violence. But we can disagree about that. I would say, though, that we talk about opportunity cost and you say that the benefit that they bring is cheap labor. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is that is that like your main reason is that your only reason or for, i i don't really personally care about things like when you talk about like culture or ancestry so like when you were talking earlier about like if your parents built the railroad or whatever these aren't usually things that i care about i i don't like identifying okay. like this so the economic argument is generally my go-to argument economic and well-being around the world is usually my my go-to's for things like immigration okay well that's um that's interesting you say that because I was looking at statistics from the survey of income program participation, and mm-hmm. it said that, you know, because if we're going to say that, that cheap labor is an economic benefit, well, I think we should also look at not only the, the net positive to our economy, but also the net negative, because we know that in a society you contribute, but you could also take, and, you know, this is an equation. It's not just one variable. If we look at the at this the, these numbers from the survey of income program participation, where they survey welfare users in the country— if you look at welfare overall, welfare usage overall, uh-huh. 30% of native households consume welfare 
or are dependent on some form of welfare, 51% of immigrant households. For Medicaid, it's 23% natives, 42% immigrants. For food subsidies, 22% natives, 40% immigrants. Cash welfare, it's 10% native, 12% immigrant. Housing, it's 6% native, 6% immigrant. So overall, overall, they're, they're about two-thirds. They consume ter- two-thirds more welfare, uh, overall, for Medicaid, it's double. For food, it's double. And if you look at uh, FAIR, if you look at there's this immigration institution called FAIR, they calculated that in, in every state of the union, all 50 states, immigrants, illegal immigrants in particular, and that's the cheapest labor that there is, mm-hmm. consume more in public services than they produce in gross domestic products. So if they're consuming more in welfare, both legal and illegal, how can you say that it's a net benefit to the economy if there's cheap labor? Sure. So as it stands right now, Based on what, on what I've seen, like uh, like Borja State, that right now it probably comes out at a wash insofar that we pay a ton of benefits out in terms of welfare to people immigrating in versus the value that they bring to the economy. I think that mm-hmm. that is a problem. I think it's a bigger problem mm-hmm. even in Europe or Germany than it is in the United States. But the yeah. difference is what, what I would want to do is I would want to model an economic policy that makes it so that people are selecting the U.S. because of labor opportunities, not because of welfare opportunities. So if you tell me that Hispanics or people that immigrate are overrepresented in welfare, I wouldn't disagree with that. It's de- from every number I've seen, that's definitely true. But what I would want to do is I would say that we should restrict the types of welfare available for these people because if people are selecting your country as an immigration spot, you want them to select it because of labor opportunity, not because of government welfare opportunity. Okay. And and I would agree with that. I would agree with that completely, actually, which is um, that's why I, I tend to stray away from the immigration or, or rather the economic arguments, because someone like you who is intellectually honest and has integrity, which I give you credit for, I argued with Will Nardi and he would just not accept that, you know, it's either a wash or it's a net negative. So I appreciate mm-hmm. that you would say that reform is necessary. I would agree with that. Um, and why I stray away from the economic typically is because, you know, even if it was a net positive, I would still be against it. So I think we can find some middle ground and actually agree on that one, that our immigration policy should be at least um, to serve the economic interests or, or whatever else, that it, it shouldn't be for people to go on welfare. So for sure. so that we agree on. And, and I think, and, could, I, and I would go further, and I would say that European countries probably have a much more significant problem with this than we do. That immigrants going to Germany or Sweden are going to be a bigger drain on those states because the welfare benefits that they offer are substantially greater than what's in the United States. When you want, an, when you want an immigrant selecting your country as a spot to immigrate to, you want them to select it for economic reasons that aren't based on welfare from the government, right? Definitely. Okay. Well, good. Good. I'm, I'm glad. So you're, you're a reasonable person in that sense. Um, so. I think we can move into the last the last two things I wanted to discuss, the last two places to come at you, because um, we're, at, we're at about an hour and a half, you know, maybe we go another half hour on these last two, um, is this. So we talk about cost benefit, and I, I always say, you know, it's not the economic, it's constitutional, it's the historical precedent, and then it's also about social trust. It's about social capital for me, which is a big thing. And you may have heard of Robert Putnam before, you may not have, he's pretty esoteric for, for the mainstream. But there was a Harvard study done by this the premier sociologist, I think, of the past 50 years, Robert Putnam. Uh-huh. And uh, so he was a professor, and he found that ethnic diversity is directly correlated with low social trust. And, and these are his own words. He said that the most diverse human habitation in the world, Los Angeles, he found to have the lowest social trust in the United States. He also found, and, and people think this is like a race thing or whatever, but he also found that even in rural South Dakota— that you would have lower social trust between Swedes and Norwegians, who are our neighbors, obviously, who share a common history, culture, and everything else. But social trust is even degraded there because of these differences. So I would say that is it, and this is what me and James also talk a lot about on our program, is is it worth it? In your, in your vision, is the value judgment correct that we are sacrificing social trust, homogeneity, you know, less violence, people being able to trust each other, have community in pursuit of, of cheap labor, which amounts to cheaper consumer goods, higher GDP. Is that the value judgment that you would make for society? So the way that I see the economic argument is I feel like the economic argument bleeds over into a lot of other sectors of society. So when a country starts to do well economically, I think that the infrastructure for their health improves. I think that necessarily the government has to change at at some point. Um, I I think that... um, 
you start to see benefits in education because as your people become more wealthy, they demand higher access to things like better schools, better hospitals, and all of these things. I think that economically, I think that you can empower a, a lot of people to, to do better things or, or to live better lives. And when I say better, I mean it even in the sense that crime will drop, people will become more educated so, like that. So when you ask me, there is a current social thing that exists in humans where, and this is something that um, even without citing a study, I would, I would believe because I think that people in general are, are somewhat tribalistic. We usually get along with people that look like us, that, that are more similar to us. Um, so, so that's something that I can inherently believe. I would argue that the idea of changing these values socially is worth it for all of the other economic gains that you can make by intermingling economies around the world and letting every country kind of build up and join the first world rather than like building walls and keeping people kind of in their own fucked world in order to keep your own country homogenous yeah i would i would make the argument that that trade-off is is necessary or or at least worthwhile i'm sorry maybe i should say instead of necessary okay yeah sure and and i would sort of differentiate the two which is number one, the cheap labor, because I think this is important. Cheap labor is good for us mm -hmm. because it boosts health. It, it makes the government better, makes people happier and education is better. Um, and that was that was sort of the first part. And then the second part was also it's and this wasn't the primary thing, but additionally has the effect that it lifts third world countries into the first world. And we could all sort of enjoy with trade and with immigration. So I would. I would contend with the first one. I don't know if this is something that did, you know, this may be sort of an impasse, but, and this is pretty existential. I think this has a lot to do with where we derive meaning um, for our lives and where we assign value as a society. And this is where I think you're a bit of a neoliberal. And I, I don't like labels, but I, I would say that that is more of a neoliberal thought that material wealth. Um, democratization, liberalization economically. I, I've heard you say before you're a big believer in capitalism mm -hmm. is the key to a successful society. Now me when I and just to clarify that yeah. for real quick, when when you say material sure. wealth, what I like is I like the ability I like to empower people to make what they consider to be optimal choices. So okay. I, I like a common quote that was taken out of my Sargon debate it was like Destiny thinks every poor person should have an iPhone. I like the <laughs> idea that even people of low in the lower classes of society can make choices to purchase luxury goods, can get access mm -hmm. to things like when you say material wealth and you talk about a cell phone, like a cell phone empowers you to do a lot of things. It's access to the internet, right. it's access to social media media to culture to you know to communicate with work to communicate with friends like um the empowering people to make these economic decisions that really do enrich their lives in more than just a shallow material sense i only said that because i don't know when you said material sense i don't mean like having the best shoes and the coolest clothes but having a phone having a car having a decent house with a heater and air like stuff like that is, is yeah sure well and I, I think i think the reason why you begin to quibble with the material wealth is what you described as is material wealth. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, we can differentiate between conspicuous consumption and, and necessities. But I think it's because the material wealth has a pretty negative connotation, which is it's, it's sort of empty. It's sort of consumeristic. And that's why you clarified. But that is, I think, the key distinction, which is people in my generation, Generation Z, people in rural America, um, even the alt-right, people that are like neo-Nazis. I think what we've come to see is that even if you have the nice car or a car, or even if you have a cell phone or, or healthcare, everything else, you could still be pretty miserable. And it tends to be pretty miserable without the social trust. Because yeah, social to go trust one is further, not just like, uh, To go yeah. one further on what you just said, right? People that consume social media tend to report more like anxiety and depression than other people. Right. I don't disagree with that at all, sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and even beyond social media, but even people that, that have a lot of wealth, more wealth than they know what to do with. And mm -hmm. I think... You know, defining the social trust as things like community, things like having close friends, having, you know, going to the grocery store and, and seeing people, you know, going to a restaurant and, and they know your name, that sort of thing. And I think that is the the choice that society is at at this point where the West is at, where you have these like neoliberal technocrats like Macron and, and Merkel and uh, even Theresa May to an extent, Barack Obama, I'd classify as this, where they, they want to lift the country up materially to to better material standards of wealth and the conservative or, or rather the paleo conservative cultural conservatives don't really care so much about the gdp if it conflicts with this social trust and so so that was that was my big contention with the first part which is you know of course i think the cheap labor would benefit the gross domestic product would benefit like the stock market mm -hmm. the economy at large i think would be better so um, can we talk on yeah. that first point for a second? Sure. So, yeah. so can, I, we, 
so I understand, I think I understand the disagreement. So I'm going to try to verbalize both of our positions and you tell me if this is a fair summary. So, or or your position rather, you're arguing that on one hand, we can increase the size of the economy. We can provide more goods to poor people and give them access to, um, to, to phones and cars and whatnot. But the trade off on that is this kind of social trust that holds us together and, and enriches our lives in ways that material possessions might not be able to do, or actually further than that have been demonstrated not to be able to do. So, you would yes. argue that increasing immigration to grow the economy when we don't see a measurable gain in personal happiness doesn't seem to be the way to go, right? Was that a fair summary of your? Um, yeah, I would just amend the last point, which is that the 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 gain in happiness is, is marginally less valuable for material goods than from social trust. But I mean, sure. yeah, that's that's basically accurate. Okay, so. Um, okay, so I want to I want to use uh, an analogy that I had to deal with growing up, and then I, and then I'll extrapolate sure. to this. So um, I went to private school growing up, and I was a um, that we had a uniform, and basically everybody had to wear a dark like navy blue pants and a white shirt. I think every day to school, and the argument was always that if we do this, um, everybody looks the same. You don't judge anybody for wearing not the coolest clothes and not the coolest shoes or whatever. Nobody looks poor. Nobody looks rich. It puts everybody kind of on the same playing field. And growing up, I always kind of wondered, like, it seemed like there was always this false dichotomy presented where you're either all in school looking exactly the same, where nobody can bully anybody else, or Mm -hmm. you all have your own possessions and everything, but now people are shitting on each other for, you know, differences that they have. Why couldn't there be a third option where people show up and look different, but you teach the kids or kids grow up or society is structured in such a way that we don't have these horrible judgments about people that look different than us or people that have different shoes or clothes, right? And then you can see where I'm going when you extrapolate to the, to the larger population. Why can't we pay enough attention to mental health such that we have people that have phones and have access to social media, but are also cognizant of how these things might not necessarily make you happy and, and be aware of like how you can find fulfillment in your life without having to say get rid of all the immigration we can only go back to living you know where everybody looks the same why can't that third option ever be a possibility sure well i think it's um and certainly that's why i was alt light sort of uh you know a a civic nationalist for a long time because i thought basically the same thing if you come here you speak the language and everything else you should be able to to just jump in but i i would say there's a little bit of a, a fallacy of composition there that the people that are coming here are are different and, and it's sort of a mystical element i are you are you an atheist? I know it's a personal question, but it, um, I mean, are you? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Uh, sure. Well, I, I'm a little bit. I'm Catholic, but I'm also pretty pretty mystical. Pretty. Um, I do believe in sort of this supernatural mystical thing where not only are people racially different, but I think the different peoples of the world are, are spiritually different. There's a, a totally different spirit that animates them. And and for many, for many like left-leaning people, for many like capitalist, materialist, philosophically materialist type people, this might come across as corny or superstitious or silly, but I really believe that there is something more that is lost when you degrade the nation or the tribe or the country as a unit. And so I would say that I don't really agree with this analogy that it's inimical to to changing your clothes as it is to changing like your blood lineage to a, a particular place, to particular people, having particular rituals and customs and gods and, and everything else. I, it, I don't think that's that's quite it. Aren't like most Mexicans Catholic, though? All right, so wouldn't they be similar? I, I, I didn't remember what specific denomination you said you were. Yeah. yeah, I'm Catholic, and, and Mexicans so certainly are Catholic. But even do they even share their like a similar soul? Or? No, I, I think— it is more similar than Africans. I think it's more similar than Asians because you have had this 500 year uh, mixing, basically, you know, the Colombian exchange where they have had intermixing with Europeans and they do have Catholic um, doctrine and they have had that for for a pretty long period of time. Not not relative to human history, but um, rev- relative to this country. So I would say they're closer than others. But even with even with um, Amerindians, which is like the people in the mountains, which is Peruvians, there's a different application of Catholicism that is characteristically spiritually um, Amerindian, which is to say that they have still, in certain sects, human sacrifices. They still have these superstitious, um, very, very primitive beliefs. And, and certainly in Africa, the same is true. It's even, even a shorter time to quote unquote assimilate into Christianity where they still believe in voodoo. They still believe in black magic. They believe in this. You believe in God and like good things happen to you there. It's not Thomas Aquinas. It's not Augustine and and things like that. So 
I what mean, if, that's so just kind yeah. of talking on this. What what about the immigrants that come here and are like super integrated? Like, have you, are you familiar with the immigrant stereotype where the immigrant that comes over and actually does very well is actually super anti-immigration? Have you ever heard of that stereotype before? Yeah, and and sir, I'm Mexican. You know, I'm I'm 25 percent Mexican. Okay, cool. So uh, I'm I'm 50 percent Cuban, and my mom is exactly like that, where she would agree with every single thing you said, uh, and loves Trump to death, and would give her life to go back to the Air Force and die for fucking Trump, because that's what my kind of person my mom is, right? But but these are people that are Cuban, or you said you're of Mexican descent. So do you think mm -hmm. that like a quarter of your soul is tainted, or how does that work? Uh, well, no, because and this is to get technical. Um, Hispanics, on average, are actually have 67% European bloodline. So if, if you do the math, that would be like, uh, I'd be 91% European and 9% Amer Indian. So, you know, I, I don't know if we would break it down to the numbers, but I think when you're talking about bringing in um, people that are not European, people that are not spiritually from Europe, and, and that is 91% of me, I, I just think it's it's different. And and maybe, you know, the trappings are the same. Maybe individually they can change, but we're not talking about individuals here. We're talking about, we're not talking about like the wealthy ones, because certainly, you know, I don't believe in no assimilation or no integration. It's happened before. You look at Thomas Sowell and the guy is, you know, he's on par with everyone else. Maybe his soul is different. I couldn't speak to that, but certainly he, he by all appearances he's integrated. But we're talking about the fundamental transformation where by 2065, we're not talking about one individual Hispanic who's anti-immigration. We're talking about 30 percent of the country being Hispanic, 14 percent Asian and 14 percent black. I think it's a fundamentally different proposition between, you know, one individual who might be integrated. And if it's even possible for there to be integration when you have no ethnic, racial, linguistic or religious majority in the country. I guess I, got, I would hope that we can kind of assimilate on, on shared I, I guess on just being Americans. I mean, even when you talk about like assimilation, like there are dramatically different values between like rural people and city people, right? Like you could like there are some rural people that would probably have more in common with people in African countries than they would with like city Democrats, city liberals or whatever, right? Depending on what cities and what specific towns you're taking. So I, I guess like this this idea of like this cohesive overall American identity, um, I don't know if it's even ever existed that some immigrant could come here and somehow simultaneously mesh with every part of it. That just seems really confusing to me. I think for for a long time it, I mean, there's always the urban rural divide that's existed since the beginning of time. But but certainly you saw that the number one the urbanization has been relatively a recent trend, and number two the the cosmopolitan nature of the city has also been a recent trend. Whereas before, New York, uh, Texas, California, Illinois, these could go red or blue. But since you've seen cities become dominated by a very particular class of wealthy, white, cosmopolitan elites, of Hispanics, blacks, and other minorities, it, it has sort of changed the dynamic. Whereas before, you know, you've always had urban and rural, but I think it's gotten extremely more polarized before 65 and you know i i don't have numbers on that but certainly you can look at the electoral history where they could go republican or democrat based on constitutional arguments based on a pretty american um consensus so i would say i i would disagree that it's that it's always been that way um and and so that's that's for our country your your secondary argument, which is that it would benefit other people in other countries, and and we can close with this because I think this is something that you would find interesting, uh -huh. which is that me and Will Nardi talked about this. If you want to make other countries ascend into the first world, which I do, um, I think the best way to do it is to have them living side by side separately in their own nations because – you look at what effect immigration has, and, and you talked about this yourself, how when they're coming from Africa or they're coming from Asia, we're talking about the, the upper echelon, the top 10 percent with the ambition, the innovation, the, the potential and everything else. I mean, it really has an effect on those countries when every year you're taking the top, you're taking the cream of the crop right off. You're taking the top 10 yeah, so percent. This concept is yeah. called brain drain. It's been theorized yes, before, exactly. but I don't think there's ever been like any evidence of it having a negative impact on a country. I, I'm familiar with the concept because I because that was one of the things that I looked for for a high school labor. If it had a detrimental impact on any of the native countries and it didn't seem like that impact had ever been shown. Like it's been people can talk about it, but that's never been shown to negatively impact any country. Sure. Well, I think it would be very difficult to demonstrate. I think it would be very difficult to empirically prove that the people that came here um, would have benefited their countries because, of course, there are innumerable, innumerable variables. But I would say that almost using a priori reasoning, 
I mean, we can basically, I think, assume that it would be true. And I'm, I'm against that sort of thing. But if, if you imagine, as you said, that immigration is a tough process and it requires ambition and we want people that want to come here to work, you know, regardless of whether they would have been Mark Zuckerberg of India or the Congo, you are taking a pretty sizable proportion of ambitious, talented people from native countries when they could have made their own countries great. I mean, wouldn't you see that? Wouldn't you say that that does happen? That there is some element of that? Well, if we're if we're speaking in completely disprovable hypotheticals, I mean, I could counter and say something like, because I'm a big free market guy, I could argue that maybe that ambition wouldn't exist because they would know they wouldn't have a place to go to. Maybe you've got a kid that grows up in um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Where did he grow up at? Like some in Austria, I think, in like some farm yeah. town. Right. He That's always right. dreamed of becoming a huge power lifter or whatever. Maybe if he hadn't been exposed to Western media and seen that people, um, you, you know, celebrated that type of thing, maybe he just goes on to be a sheep herder for the rest of his life. Or, or you, maybe you can make that same argument for any other person. Like they, they see that if we do well, we can send our kids to America to study and it'll be awesome and they'll have an amazing life. Maybe all they do is subsistence farming and they don't see that they can send people to America. So they don't really care and they don't really try that hard. Right. We could you could make sure, any well. hypothetical. Yeah, well, I, I think if you if you used a comparative analysis, I think it would be more beneficial to say that, you know, if you look at our policy where people come over here for and the people that are legal and we assume the upper echelon, they're coming here and they're working and they have opportunities. They get technical training or or they get some kind of education that wouldn't be available in their country and they can use capital that isn't available in their country, both, um, you know, in terms of machinery, in terms of businesses, in terms of financial capital and everything else. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be helpful if we compared that to China's policy, where China, um, for for I think it's been the past decade, has been taking in African, not immigrants, but they've been taking in a pretty a pretty sizable amount of Africans from East Africa in particular, and they bring them in and they put them in schools and they give them vocational training, they give them like world class education, and then the Africans go back and they use those skills in their countries to make them better. I, I think when you look at those two systems, it sort of demonstrates. Which one would be better served to help people of the third world? Would yeah. it be the one where... So yeah. my, my, my philosophy is based off of, of kind of a self-interested point of view. I don't disagree that that would be like the optimal thing to do for the other country. But one, I don't think that policy would ever be sold to the average person. That would be almost impossible to do. And two... Why not? to sell the idea that we need to contribute a ton of money and because you've got people in your in your own country that are going to be deprived of that experience when you're paying for other countries I, I think that that would probably be a negative well they would pay their way i mean they they would pay their way either through you know they would work or they okay would pay when, taxes when you said or, when you said that they took in people for vocational training i, I was under the impression you made it sound like or I, I, it sounded to me like china was subsidizing this education somehow Oh, yeah. No, I, don't, I don't believe so. No, I, oh, I believe okay. the Africans did contribute. Yeah. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, I'm sure that to some extent, I'm sure that happens to some extent anyway, right? That people that come over here and become very successful over here either go back to their country to either give speeches or inspire people in those countries to do things. Um, I, and like I said, I, I would have to go and or I can't find anything. I tried to look at this before because this is one of the big things um, in researching the economic argument for immigration. Brain drain is one of those hypotheticals that's brought up. But again, I just it hasn't been demonstrated at all that there are countries that had like a bunch of high talent people that moved away. Or, or like if you look at like India, since we have the H-1B system, there are no good computer scientists in India, no programmers in India because they all come to the United States. Like it just doesn't seem the like brain that drain. happens. Yeah. It's a brain drain, right? Yeah, that doesn't seem like it happens. Well... I would say that um, I think that would be a, and you say that it's the self-centered argument that, you know, we want them to come here. But but then I, I think that kind of completely abrogates your argument that that we're doing this for the benefit of other countries. Right. Because if you say that, well, we don't want them to we want them to go back and maybe they make speeches or maybe they, they invest in a, you know, dem programs, you know, there's mm -hmm. an NGO or whatever. But systemically, they're contributing to our economy. They're creating jobs for our country. They're, you know, uh, inspiring our people, paying taxes for our government instead of sending them back so they could make their own countries great. I don't think you can then turn it around and say, like, we're trying to bring people into the 21st century if, if you're saying it's actually self-centered, right? Yeah. So the way that I view it is a, a better world for everybody is, is the best is the most optimal self-centered position that if we took so let's say that we take um two separate worlds okay we diverge heavily sure. at this point okay in one world let's say trump builds the 100 foot tall cement wall and everybody's on board and we kick all mexicans out and we'll say that mexico remains kind of fucked and nothing really happens blah 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 that 
50 years from now, you've got an America that's probably still doing decently, I would imagine, and then you've got a Mexico that's just kind of fucked. It's kind of shitty. It's whatever. Um, right. if, we, if we take an alternative route where we work as much as we can with Mexico to, to help them build their country or do whatever we need to do, whether it's via NAFTA, um, whether it's via whatever other type of aid or help that we can do with the country, if we go 50 years in that direction, let's say that Mexico becomes a, a strong, self-sufficient, cartel-free, uh, no-drug-trade country, right? Well, now um, this is something that you could rationalize from a totally self-interested position. Um, a lot of our car manufacturing, I think 20% of, of the, the cost of like vehicles can be a Attributed to manufacturing in Mexico, like we get a ton of imports from there for any car manufacturing, for a lot of different agricultural stuff. We get a lot of imports, right? Um, and we export to that country a lot as well. That if Mexico is stronger and healthier, one, it solves our immigration problem. Two, it gives us an awesome trade partner. Three, it gives us a barrier against other types of not just illegal immigrants like Mexicans, but maybe other more nefarious types or drug trade people, right? That having in that future having a Mexico that is a strong independent country, it's nice for Mexico, but it's also really nice for America, right? If we could if we could copy paste. Canada to our southern border, ignoring the racial things that I know you like that I don't care about, right? If they were <laughs> Hispanic Canadians, that would be awesome for America. That would be a really good thing, right? That, so that's kind of how my, even though you, I, I try to sell it to people as a like, well, look, we're helping these people. But my ultimate argument is always that at the very end, like if we had a world where there were no Islamic extremists anywhere, that would be a better world, right? If there were no fucked areas in the world where yeah. the birth rate was 7.0 or, you know, we, none of that crazy economic bullshit or anything anywhere in the world that everybody in the world would be better off. Not just those countries, but everybody would be. Imagine if I could stream or you could stream and you had a million fans in fucking Africa, right? Or if you had 2 million mm -hmm. people in China that could consume your content, right? That this kind of stuff benefits yeah. everybody. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, and, uh, no I, I, don't ag <clears throat> I don't disagree with the premise that making the other countries wealthier would be beneficial. I, I just disagree with how you do it, which is that you say that, you know, somehow they come here and they and they become, you know, they they somehow spur job creation in Mexico. And and maybe, you know, they start a car company and they they export the cheap labor to Mexico and Mexicans make the cars and somehow they go from manufacturing cars to like first world country. I don't I don't see how that transition happens just by way of them coming here. But I would just believe that more broadly if you have a program where they're getting trained here and mm -hmm. they take those skills and they go back to their country and create jobs in their country, wouldn't that be the easiest road, the path of least resistance to have a systemic class of people in their country making it better than like there's more just American entrepreneurs? Because, I mean, that's really what you're saying is sure, more I mean, that, American entrepreneurs, but from other countries. I don't I don't see yeah, how that, that benefits those countries. Well, like, I, I'm sure that to some extent, I'm sure that happens. I'm sure there are people that come here and get educated and go there. But no, I don't. I want everybody that gets educated. I don't want any of that um, leaving the United States. I want us to be the pool for the best talent, for the brightest minds, for the best engineers and scientists, especially as our economy continues to shift more and more into a service economy. I think we need to hold on to those highly educated people as much as possible. So I, I wouldn't want to see them all shipped off i mean i'm sure it will happen by by simple numbers that if a million people come here and get educated some percentage of them will leave but i would hope that through economic activity we've incentivized those people to stay here as much as possible i don't know what city do you live in or you don't have to say if it's too or maybe i live in state. chicago oh okay so you don't so you don't have to deal with this but i live in a city called omaha nebraska right it's very small yeah. um we deal with this where we have people that this is kind of a microcosm of this particular problem where we educate people and it I'm sure it happens in kansas city st louis and, and all these others like comparable cities too, where you educate these people and then they go and they leave and they go somewhere else because you haven't given right. them any incentives to stay here. And we do this all the time. And I'm like, we need to incentivize certain businesses to move in here so that we can keep our talent from going other places. Right. Then, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to bring in a bunch of people, educate them and then ship them off. I would hope that they would want to stay here. Right. Because growing that resource of labor is, is one of the fundamental ways to grow an economy. Well, but I mean, using your analogy, if you said that it's, it's like really good, mm -hmm. if Mexico is rich but you just said that, well, they're leaving Omaha and they're not enriching Omaha. Well, then aren't aren't you admitting then that they leave Omaha after they've received their education and their skills to go enrich and raise the standard of living of other places? Maybe that don't need it, but but have it. I mean, that that kind of bolsters my argument that if they come to America, they get educational training, maybe they contribute for the short time that they're here, but then they go back. Maybe they don't benefit us directly, but they certainly benefit us indirectly by going back to their countries and, and creating more wealth. Because I think you're you're sort of assuming, and this is something, if, if you've ever read Ian Fletcher, he's very much against anti, or he's very much against free trade. He says that globalism, like this global economy, doesn't really exist. The, the costs 
for shipping your goods. The costs for having like a truly multinational business are so high that most businesses make the majority of their money, do the majority of their business in the country that they're in. And so you're talking about bringing in Mexicans so they could become American entrepreneurs. That doesn't, just because they came from Mexico, that doesn't benefit Mexico. It benefits Mexico if they go to America, receive education, and then come back. And so yeah, I, I I'm not necessarily saying that immigration is the only way to benefit another country. The, and the comparison well, between you like- said it is one way. And well, how immigration does, and trade and, and other things- it, um, I, I mean, you could argue that by so if there are so many workers that can't find work in that country, that them immigrating to the United States, ignoring the fact that some percentage of them will probably go back, I, I would imagine. Um, you're also decreasing the labor pool over there, which could increase wages for some of the natives over there. Maybe it helps them find better work or maybe it spurs on the government to change something. If too much of their labor pool is leaving, maybe it causes them to revise their incentive structure or something. Um, Does that happen in Mexico, though? I mean, Mexico has seen like upwards of 15 million people come over our borders in the past 20 years and they they have they have flat out refused i mean they still like hand out leaflets in in low income communities to tell them about how great america is i mean they're literally nope. sending them over here still i don't think that i'm not sure if that happens or if you're talking about That's like docu- leaflets that tell you how to not get killed um, but yeah, I mean, something has obviously happened. If you've watched the the immigrant numbers from Mexico, I think for the first time in like I, I, maybe I don't know in how many years, like the number of Mexicans that are in the country has actually started to reach net. Ne- um, there's a net negatives in terms of um, immigration that we're seeing less and less and less people come over. Um, I think that started. I want to say that first time that happened was in 2014, maybe 2015, that we've seen less and less Mexicans come over to the United States. So I, I, something is obviously changing. Well, yeah, but that wasn't the result of, of oh, government I- policy. I mean, what what was the government policy where Mexico wanted to keep their low-income people? I mean, you said that, like, maybe something—I mean, this is all—you understand that your your arguments for this are all pretty loose. It's all pretty like, well, maybe sometimes something like this, something like that. I mean, all these low-income people have been pouring across our borders, millions of them, mm-hmm. and it's if they were so valuable, if they were such, like, winners, if they— now they were benefiting their countries, wouldn't they want them back? I mean, wouldn't they want to keep these people, the cheap labor? I mean, you said well, like the, 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 well, well, clearly they can't find. I mean, if we just go by basic incentive structure, they can't find that type of work over in Mexico. If you've got somebody that's capable of building a house or putting on a roof, if there's no roofs to be roofed in Mexico, then they would come to the United States to do it or something like that, right? That just because you have a, a pool of people that could maybe work, if you don't have economic um, opportunity available for them to work, they can't like invent that, right? If the demand doesn't exist for it. Yeah, I, I just. Generally speaking, I just find this economic argument pretty problematic because at once you you seem to acknowledge that, like you said with your Omaha example, that mm-hmm. that people come there, they get their education, and then they don't enrich Omaha because they leave. They then enrich the places that they go to. And you well, also the, the say difference, that, the difference, the key difference there. I was only using that as an example for for keeping talent in place. Like the difference there is that people are born in Omaha, stay in Omaha, and then leave. That, that's that's different okay. than people immigrating to Omaha. Getting it's kind of an important distinction, but. Well, why would why would we not want talent to stay in America? Wouldn't we want to to have Mexican talent go back to Mexico so they can enrich Mexico? I mean, that's you you yourself said that'd be really good for us if Mexico were rich and first world, and we want to bring these people up. Isn't that the way to do it? Is to send them human capital? I mean, they send us their their cheap labor, and you know maybe we take some, but then also we send back high skilled people, and they make Mexico good. I mean, isn't that? Well, so just, that- it's it's a question of philosophy. I don't believe that a government should be able to direct a person to go to a particular place. I, if the incentive structure was in place, that would be really cool. If maybe Mexico finds a way to incentivize engineers or something that they can't educate or something, in, in that case, then sure. If the people that come over here and get educated find a better incentive for them over in Mexico, then I, I guess they go back to Mexico. Like, sure. But but well, I'm I mean, not in but, favor of like the government directing like, well, you came here, and got educated. Now you must return to your country to make it a better place. I don't think anybody is under that obligation. I just think it would be a different program instead of immigration. You would call it. I mean, because it's people sort of do this where they say, like, we want immigration because it'll help for foreign, foreign countries. But then it's like, well, you know, actually, we can't control where people go. I mean, it would just if we want to help foreign countries don't take all their best people, train their best people at a cost, and then they can go back. And it's not like it's not like you got your education out and I'll get the hell out. But like, 
here, we can take you in our schools and you can work here for cheap labor while you're in school and you can pay taxes and you can, I don't know, maybe there's some other way you can contribute. You can pay for this program and then you can go back and, but it's not like you come here and you stay here and we pretend that's a net benefit for their country they came from. I just, I always have a problem with people sure. who pretend like this is yeah, and I, and I agree. And I, yeah, I agree with that. And and I look at this from much more an economic point of view. I'm not. You'll never find me tweeting like diversity is our greatest strength or any of these types of arguments. <laughs> right. Um. I, I I think that these are ridiculous propositions. Um. In so far as like building other countries, you I, when you talk about people that benefit from immigration. Just because Mexicans benefit doesn't necessarily mean Mexico can benefit. I'm sure there are better ways to benefit Mexico than via some immigration policy. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that Mexico is the like the next highest place that Americans live outside America. So people obviously go over there for something, business opportunity, educate, probably not education, but probably for business or economic reasons. Um, I, I mean, when when immigrants make the decision to come to the United States to get educated, that's something that benefits the immigrant, it should, if they're making that economic decision to do so. And hopefully, if we have the correct incentives in place, which we might not exactly have right now in the United States, is also something that benefits the United States. So th this is why I advocate for things like immigration, because it can benefit. There are three parties that benefit there, right? Um, the Mexican immigrant benefits, maybe not necessarily the country of Mexico. There are other ways to do that, but maybe so if they go back eventually. Um, the country benefits because of the increased access to labor. Um, or and I was going to say businesses, but that counts as the country, I guess. So, yeah. Well, I, I just, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I get what you're saying. And it fundamentally comes down to this economic proposition. Um, and then oh, I really. Also, real quick, yeah. just to go back to what you said before, that was very strange to me. I hadn't heard this, yeah. that, that multinational businesses are actually more expensive and that they don't do. I, that seems very strange to me. Why is so much manufacturing and everything done in countries like China if it's so disadvantageous? Yeah, no, I, I didn't say that manufacturing in other countries was disadvantageous, but I was talking about in the sense that an, a nation is operational truly in multiple nations, not in the sense that they do business in other nations, but like they're they're buying and selling in multiple nations where it's you can really call like, for example, Walmart mm -hmm. a multinational. I mean, certainly there are some I think actually Walmart's probably a poor example, but um, where you have businesses that they do the majority of their business in the United States, even though they might have components of their business that are done elsewhere. And you can look at uh Ian Fletcher, I forget the numbers off the top of my head because it was, it was a book I read a pretty long time ago. But it's an interesting question where he talks about this this globalization, how in, in a lot of ways it's basically a myth where the majority of the businesses that operate in America serve America and, and vice versa for other countries. But uh, just because of logistical costs and, and uh, labor costs and, and everything else. I guess but, that, that just sounds kind of like a weird way of talking about globalization like if you like so would you say that like a company like ford that has vehicles that are manufactured like in germany that this doesn't count as a globalized company because it mainly operates in america or no i think it was just more speaking to i guess um what sort elasticity i think is what he was referring to in the sense that um like transportation costs, all these costs associated with doing business in a country that isn't your own, mm -hmm. aren't like completely mitigated like people make it out to be. Like in 2017, you can truly have like a global business in many countries and and do. I, I remember some number, something like 60 percent of 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 business. I forget what the sector was, but these businesses did 67% of their business and revenue in the country that they were from. Again, I, I forget the specifics. Um, it's just something like, you know, the Iraq war thing you brought up. It's sort of a separate issue trade. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just something that Ian Fletcher had, had written down that it's, um, sort of a common misconception, but I guess, I mean, I, I would it, imagine that like you you probably have to reach a certain like economy of scale to, t to fully take right. advantage of like multinational things. Like if I were exactly. to try to like, uh, yeah, like if I were to try to like start my own streaming service, I probably don't have the fan base to make that a profitable venture. So I, I wouldn't blame that on globalism. It would be because I'm not a large enough company and I'm imagine most companies aren't of the size where they could take advantage of, of kind of like globalized ideas, um, like, right. just, like exporting your value chain and, and all this type of trade and whatnot. So, 
But, well, yeah, and, and that's the thing is scale. Is there, mm-hmm. And that's what he was saying is there are very few companies in the world that are, like you said, it is a matter of scale where they're able to truly compete on a, a global level. But Sure, but those few companies the, can be very important, right? Like our, Apple is yeah, sure. a company that you could argue is globalized, like the manufacturing of a lot of different components and the final assembly and whatnot of value chain related stuff in China has made a lot of products a lot more affordable. The exporting of our value chains in Mexico has made automobiles much more affordable. Like, I, I mean, there are a lot of things that even if not every company is massively multinational and globalized. The ones that are, we seem to all know who they are, right? You're probably looking at an Asus or something monitor that was probably made in Taiwan or something, you know? Well, well yeah, absolutely. But I mean, the, the multinational corporations, I think what we were referring to was, does it value third world or, or rather the origin countries of immigrants to have them become entrepreneurs here or to become high skilled laborers over there? I think, you know, if we're talking about these these enormous corporations that are few and far between, mm-hmm. maybe you get one that was uh, founded by an immigrant in America, or, or you get a handful, I mean, if we're being generous. But the vast majority, I think if we're talking about a, a general policy, it would benefit Mexico more to have maybe 500,000 high-skilled laborers trained in America and sent back to Mexico than two um, mega corporations that maybe they get some manufacturing and of course they have to compete with Indochina and Africa and other countries or they will in the coming years um, you know maybe they make they might get some jobs they don't have that that contribution but oh maybe again, That's, I, that gets into really complicated things though right because again like you can't right. the structures have to be in place to capitalize off of certain types of labor like if I were to just drop if I dropped 20,000 high skill engineers into San Francisco this these guys could all find work San Francisco would be doing better everybody would be doing better as a result if I could just magically do that well except the existing engineers might see a, a slight pay decrease um, depending on what they are but if I drop 20,000 like high level theoretical computer scientist engineers into like Sudan that's probably not going to help Sudan much they're not going to be able to create the structures necessary or create the capital necessary to take advantage of their talents to, to use them in ways that would benefit the country you don't think they have a need for for people with uh, skills I mean that's I mean, that's sort of like why they're coming here, right, is for is for skills, for jobs. Well, you don't coming. think they can create opportunities if they had a college degree from a Western university? I mean, why why would anyone come to Western universities if that wasn't the case? Well, because a lot of the opportunity exists here as well, right? No, they're very, or I've never heard somebody say, like, I want to be a computer scientist because I heard that Niger or, like, Nigeria or, you know, Sudan or Chad, like, really needs computer scientists because the pay over there sucks. Like, they don't have the structures in place to capitalize off of that type of labor. You, you come to the United states and then you're probably going to another country that has an establishment that has a structure in place to take advantage of right the capital necessary to to exploit your labor to in exchange for like a wage right well i mean i think then that gets to the fundamental point though is if you never have them build up their own capital if they are basically dependent on american capital financial industrial etc to take advantage of human capital i mean they're never going to get anywhere because that's they're rich in the factors of production, which are their natural resources and their labor. The missing component is capital. And you create capital. It, it's very difficult. It's very hard. It's not rewarding. I mean, you could say that, oh, oh, well, this this sort of ethereal opportunity doesn't exist. But, sh- I mean, there's that Nigerian, I think he's a uh, steel magnate. I forget the name of him, but he's, he's the first African billionaire. And he, he's making his own capital. And people certainly uh, in Africa have made their own capital. And if you send them back with high skills, I don't think you would contend that people with low skills are going to be the ones to create this capital. It would be ones that have experience, that have networks in, in, in European countries that would, they would get with uh, an internship or some, some form of training from a Western country. But they would have to go back and, and create the capital. Otherwise, they, they're well, never going to sure. get out of that But I don't know track. if people would ever make those economic decisions, make the decision to go to the United States to get educated so that they can send you back to your shit country. What if they had to? What if they had to, <clears throat> though? What if immigration wasn't an option? Well, like if, so like if Romania forcibly exported people to get educated and come back and work for the country? Yeah. I mean, I guess that could... I mean, you could do it. It's something that I'm philosophically opposed to, though. I don't usually like governments ordering people to do things. But, I, I mean, yeah, I guess you could argue that under that. that well, would... it could be an incentive. It could be like, you know, the Romanian oh, incentive government. I agree with. So, yeah, let's, okay. say, let's say that the Romanian government, let's say that the Romanian government made a program where they said that we want to support um, these types of computer businesses, right? So we're going to provide right. some sort of incentive structure so that if you're an engineer um, and you're native-born, you can go that high, I guess, if they're trying to keep talent from leaving. Um, schools do this, right, by charging higher out of state tuition, mm-hmm. right? That, um, or charging less institution right that if, if you want to create an incentive structure like that then the country is free to do so i, I would i would 
I think I would support something like that. It, would get, it gets really complicated because of trade. Like a lot of people don't like to deal with countries that have certain incentive structures in place. But I'm sure that depending on your particular country, maybe you could make it go. Um, right. Like some people might say, well, I don't want to I don't want to do business with Romania because they subsidize their industry and it's not fair. So I would tariff those products or something. But I'm sure that you could figure out some sort of way to incentivize that that talent to stay in your country, whether it's by getting rid of corruption in the government, do, alleviating certain tax rates or giving some types of tax incentives to certain things that, yeah, I would be 100 percent in favor of that. And anything that makes the economic decision um, something that people would choose on their own. Sure. Well, and I, I think that's a good note to close on. It's getting a little mm -hmm. late. We're two hours, 10 minutes in. And I I'm pretty satisfied. I think we covered all the bases. We talked about the legal. We talked about the economic, the cultural, the social, the mystic, you know, the spiritual. So I think we've covered all the bases. I, I'm satisfied with leaving it there with um, the trade thing because I think that's I think you've made a fair point. I think I've made a fair point and we came to a middle ground on that. So I think we could call it a night. Do you have anything else more to add? Um, no, I mean, I appreciate the conversation. Thanks for not screaming or shouting or anything. So, I Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, de definitely. And I appreciate you coming on. I, you know, I always try and be a good sport towards the end because you were a great sport coming on. And a lot of people warned me. They were like, you know, this destiny, he likes to motor mouth over you and he gets really hung up on the details. And, and you know, you got to be careful. But, you know, I, I thought you were pretty fair. I thought, you know, and, and there's rhetorical things that's, you know, that happens in a debate that we're all guilty of that. So I thought you were a, a, a fair, honest um, conversationalist. So I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate the conversation. All right, man. Have a good one. Yeah, uh, we'll talk later, I guess. All right, later. Bye-bye. I think in terms of, like, optics, I think I need to figure out areas to see that I don't care about. He did it to me at the beginning, and I didn't counter do it, and I ended up looking really bad because of it. Um, right, right at the beginning, we were able to go back into it, but at the beginning, we were able to... Um, um, oh, at the, at the very beginning, I wanted to speak about the economic side of immigration, and he said he didn't want to at all. He didn't care about it. And then when he wanted to make arguments about the constitutional side, I should have said that I wasn't concerned about that because there was no way that I'm not – because I don't really care. <laughs> and I also don't know anything, right? So I, I, in terms of like constitutional law, like interpretation or whatnot, um, I only know like what standard day interpretation. I don't know anything about like what, what whoever you know 250 years ago felt like when he wrote posterity in, in the preamble or whatever. I have no idea. So um, I should have immediately said like, oh, I don't care about the constitutional part. I would see that. It's not something I'm interested in as well. And I would argue outside of that. I should have said that in the beginning since he did it to the economic part. Why didn't you call out of the no two-story buildings in Africa for 3,000 years? Uh, yeah, because these are, these kinds of arguments always get really weird. I don't, like, I feel like Egypt is, like, this, like, huge fighting ground where people want to fight about, because I can bring up Egypt as, like, an example, um, as, like, a decently thriving, like, African um, civilization, right? But then people say things like, um, but then people say things like, well, Egypt was actually all white people, and then you get, like, really weird and hung up into, like, crazy shit going on there, and it's like, I don't even fucking, it, that's, like, an argument that, like, I've read a lot about it, but I don't have that offhand where, like, you know, like, well, no, actually, Egyptians did... <clears throat> You didn't want to talk about how the Federalist Papers and a Supreme Court justice's personal definition of the word posterity. Yeah, like I can't, I can't have. I'm not equipped to have this discussion. I can't tell you what like the original founding. Like, I there's no way. Like, I can never even pretend to have this conversation. But like, I I don't care about this extrapolation from a single word based on some hardcore original list, like hardcore original constitutional interpretation. Like, it's not relevant at all in today's law. And I and it took me way too long. Um, but eventually, I got there, and he disagreed even with that point where I said that I don't think anybody in Congress is suggesting that we rewrite the past 200 years of immigration law because it's built on a lie. Nobody seems to have suggested that legal precedence is so important, but he argued that that could become a possibility in the future. Um, I'm interested in going back to this conversation because I felt like, for the most part, I felt like his argumentative structure was pretty valid. It sounds like he's rehearsed a lot of these before. I don't mean that negatively. I mean, like, he's had these conversations before, so it sounded like he had, um, he had, like, decent, like, top level like this is what i think because of this because of this because of this whereas a lot of people like somebody like sargon just thinks this and has no fucking idea about anything um this guy seems to have thought through most of his arguments even though i don't necessarily disagree with him or it, agree with him but it sounds like i need to um i need to start digging into like more specific examples to give um like something that something in terms of like the asian world or not the Asian world, I'm sorry, like the African world not joining the first world. Like, he seemed to be very incredulous when I said that. But this is something that, like, I'm fairly sure by most metrics that this is true. If you look at, um, but, 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 but the thing that I'm most familiar with when analyzing this is birth rates. Is usually that I'm looking for birth rates and the amount of people globally moving into, um, out of, out of poverty, um, 
but having like very specific numbers on hand. Like I'm pretty sure that if you look up like um, African country birth rates over time, like if you look it up like over time, um, you see that all of the African birth rates have been falling and falling and falling, which is good, which is what you want to happen. Um, that's why um, that's why it's it's like theorized that um, we'll never reach the thirteen bil- the thirteenth billionth person will have never been born in the world because the population is supposed to cap off by then. Yeah, and this is demonstrated pretty clearly with UN stats, but I, I need to I need to have those specific UN stats on hand. I think. Can you elaborate on that? Why are falling birth rates good? Um, uh, I don't know how much of this is based in theory versus how much is like observable history. I think it's more the latter than the former. But the idea is that when you're growing up, you need kids because your kids are like your actual like fucking capital. Like they do work for you and they keep the family running and they take care of you when you get older. And also a lot of them fucking die, um, you know. So you have lots of kids. You have to have lots and lots and lots of kids um, because a lot of them are going to die in childbirth. Um, you need them to grow. You need them to work for the family. You need them to bring income in. And as this happens, right, what happens is eventually a country reaches a point where, one, not as many kids are dying, which is good, so you don't have to have as many. Two, people are more financially secure, so they don't necessarily need these little laborers. And what you see is, like, every country that has become industrialized experiences this massive slope-off where you had a lot of children, a lot of children, but then it falls. And now we see that, like, if you look at, like, all across the Western world, um, this is, like, one of the easiest ways to tell the difference between a developed country versus, like, an un- a developing country by looking at birth rates. Um, hold on. Aren't you mixing cause and effect? Aren't the falling birth rates a result of women entering the workforce? Um, in some cases it is. Um, but I think it had more to do with like child mortality rates and just the general family not like living on subsistence farming or having or making lots of kids to like work for you to do shit is like really important. Um, If you look at, like, every industrialized country, you'll see that, like, there have been these massive slope-offs in birth rates, right? I think... Um, I don't remember what the exact sustain rate. It's like 1.95 or something. Um, but like, you'll see that like in the United States, um, and, um, in, in every, in every, in pretty much every Western country, save for, I think like Israel might be one exception, but you see like, um, these like very, very, very low birth rates in all these countries. It's just what happens when you become industrialized. Um, but you, if you look at, um, some African countries haven't experienced it as much, but like if you look at like these other countries, like look at Sudan. Like right now, Sudan has 4.3 children per woman, 4.3 births per woman, right? Um, if you go back, let's see, we're at 4.3. To get to 5.3, you go back, you know, 10, 15 years. When it comes with a no two story building years. in Africa, here is another city in Africa that had two story building and were very rich in just a list of African empires. My favorite meme was, I'm 25% Mexican, but that actually means I'm 91% European. <laughs> yeah. Fuck Mexican immigrants, BTW Nathan Ruse. Oh, I was going to, um, I was going to meme about that. Um, there are still a couple of African countries that suck, I think, in terms of birth rates. I think Chad, um, or maybe Sudan has one that hasn't changed much. Um, Nigeria's has been falling. Ethiopia's has fallen sharply, right? If we go back 30... Um, if we go back 30 years, it was 7.4 births. Now it's down to 4.2. That's a pretty sharp decline, right? Um, that this trend towards having less kids is usually indicating uh, other very positive. Your arguments are loose destiny. Mine, however, <laughs> Fuck. involve both mystic associations to spirits and voodoo, as well as precisely calculated racial percentages. This 91% euro lord is out. Dap cop and milady wir uh, must an answer blood wound boden I, I was gonna say something at the end, but everything was so polite and kind that I didn't want to be like a huge asshole. But at the end, it's kind of like a joke. I was gonna offer to donate him a hundred bucks if he would do a twenty three and me test and open the results live on stream. I think that would be like really funny. I didn't want to go into that. Well, because I think he had a lot of good arguments. I almost told him that I almost wanted to say that like your other arguments are really good. I don't think you should bring this up to anybody because these are a lot more tenuous. Um, but I didn't want to be rude. But um, I'm, I mean, I'm not interested in like looking like I won the debate. So I'm not going to sit there and like needle him hardcore on like his mystic arguments because they were kind of dumb. And I think that he probably would have um, conceded that they weren't good arguments. But so I, I don't know. I wasn't interested in like going hardcore into that.